All right, welcome to the session on uh, core design principles for software developers. Uh, my name is Venkat Subramanyam. We're going to talk about some of the things we need to think about when it comes to designing software. So I'm going to be talking quite a bit about uh, what are some of the principles we can consider when it comes to writing code on a daily basis. Uh, these are uh, principles that I have personally benefited from a great deal. Almost every single day when I write code, I think of a lot of these principles. These have been extremely valuable for uh, developing uh, software, which I consider to be a better software. So uh, I want to talk about some of these principles. Uh, the way I'm going to structure this is I'm going to talk for about an hour and 20 minutes, give or take. And then we'll take a 15-minute break, and then we'll come back for the remaining of the session and finish up the rest of the part. Um, uh, I, I really appreciate questions. If you do have a question, I certainly welcome them. Uh, but I have a problem of not being able to see through the blinding lights. So if you do have a question, speak up, ra raise your voice, draw my attention. I'll be more than happy to listen to you and then uh, participate in your discussions, questions, comments, just about anything. So with that said, let's get uh, started. The first question I want to start by asking is, uh, what do we consider as a good design? That's the very first thing I want to consider. Well, I once worked with a guy who had a really interesting way to define a good design. He said the design is good because I created it. Well, I think we need a better way of defining than that. So how do we really be objective in defining good design? That's the next question to ask. Well, I'm going to say a design is good if the cost of changing the design is minimum. So I'm going to say this design is really good because when I wanted to change it, I didn't have to spend way too much time and effort changing it. Well, while that could be a good definition, there is one big problem with that definition. And the problem is, when it comes time to change the design, you realize that this is horrible, and that's way too late to say, oh gosh, we messed up. So we need to be able to proactively say that we are creating a better design, rather than after the fact say, well, that was after all not a good design. So again, how do we really uh, define a good design then? So clearly, a good design is a design that's easier to change. So maybe one thing we can do is, maybe we can start subjecting the design to change along the way and see how the design stands up. And if it doesn't, we can, after all, uh, keep uh, you know, uh, evolving it and get it towards something that's easier to change. Well, the very first thing I want to start out by saying is, this is something that I, I am really uh, beginning to realize more and more is, uh, you know, almost, and I'm going to say almost, almost impossible to, do, uh, to get it right uh, the first time. And this is uh, something we need to keep in mind because a good design is almost impossible to get it right the first time. Uh, this is insane in my opinion because programmers want to sit down, write code once, and say, I am done. But if you really think about a lot of human activities, we never seem to do things in one time. We take several iterations to get things done. If you look at uh, evidences of um, some really famous uh, you know, artists, for example, the greatest of painters, greatest of um, uh, sculptors, they, the masterpieces they created, they never created those masterpieces in one sitting. There is evidences of several prototypes having been created, and that eventually led towards creating this masterpiece. And we come to work and think we can sit and get the coding done in one day and be done with it. So the very first thing I think we should come to realize as developers is we definitely have to give time to really create better quality software, and we have to really improve on what we do rather than just creating it once and be done with it. Because I firmly begin to believe now that uh, software is, uh, is uh, never, uh, never actually uh, written. Uh, it is always rewritten. So we definitely have to provide ourselves the opportunity to rewrite software uh, as much as we can. And why should we really care about it? Because a software has to constantly evolve. If somebody comes to you and tells you they wrote the software once and they never had to change it again, 
what they are telling you is their project got canceled. Because any software that is relevant has to change. And we have to be constantly changing and evolving software. That is extremely important. So as a result, we should really afford for the change that becomes very important to, uh, to make uh, possible. But how do we evaluate the quality of design? Well, thankfully, there are some really good ways to evaluate quality of design. And, and we're going to talk about some of those things. And how do we create good design? And I want to say, if we have to, if we want to create a really good design, there is one first step, I think. This is not easy, but we should try. The first, first and foremost, uh, to create a good design, so I'll say good design, uh, first step, uh, this is the hardest step, actually, is let go of the ego. So this is really hard for a lot of us, right? Because it's my design. I created it. Well, at some point, we got to realize, you know, we cannot be perfect. By definition, we are human. That means it rules us out. We cannot be perfect. And, and we have to really let go of that ego and work towards creating better design. And the minute we let go of the ego in us, I think we get better. And I want to say a little bit about ego. I don't think we want to really have no ego at all. But that is important. Because if we don't have any ego at all, we wouldn't have pride, we wouldn't have passion in what we do. So ego is kind of like cholesterol. You want good parts, but not the bad parts. So you want to make sure that you have the right amount of ego to really get motivated to do stuff, but not enough to stifle our progress. So, so let go of that. And the second thing I would say in this case, in creating better design is uh, be unemotional. So. Um, you know, when, we, when it comes to creating design, we often get really emotional. And you may look at this and say, gosh, this guy is talking about non-technical stuff. Well, I think that's really the first step, because these non-technical things really make it hard for us to develop better software. So we need to really be unemotional about it. So when we become unemotional, we are not attached to the solution. And what we are really attached to is solving the problem we have on hand. So one thing we could say is, uh, always I would like to, you know, as much as I can say, here is an idea. I want you to either do this or come up with something better than this. And, and when it comes to people, I think it's important to have people who can challenge each other. That's very important. And I want to say this because this is something that, again, you know, really something that I, I keenly am looking for. And I'm going to say, uh, per se, this is something that is critical to think about. When you have people working with, there are two kinds of people that are dangerous uh, to work with. Um, so who are those? So the one who can't uh, follow uh, instructions. These people are really dangerous. Two, who can only follow instructions. These are also very dangerous, right? So the folks who cannot follow instructions, you tell them what to do, you come back from lunch, they're still sitting there. They're like, I told you exactly what to do, why wouldn't you do it? The other group is even more dangerous, right? You tell them what to do and they literally did that. And you're like, in step two, you found there is a better way here, why don't you do it? Uh, because you didn't tell me to do that, right? And that's really dangerous also. So I think it's important to empower people so that people will have the courage, the confidence to deviate from your plan. And, and that's one of the times when you want people to come back and challenge. I remember this one time, I had a, a person working with me and he said, how do you do this? I said, I know exactly how to do it, but I won't tell you. And I want you to go find the answer for this. And here are some ideas. Why don't you come back and tell me what you find? But here's a little direction. About two hours later, he said, oh, by the way, thanks for that tip. I, I figured it out, and I've implemented it. I said, show me what you have. And he shows me what he has. And I said, I'm so glad I did not give you the exact answer, because what you have is way better than what I thought about. This is a much better way to approach this particular problem, better design. I think that's important for people to really be able to have that ability to come up with better ideas. That, that's very critical. So, so the question is, how do we really approach a, a good design? And, and the third thing I want to emphasize here, this I care about a lot, is um, you know, take really time. We, we don't do enough of this. Uh, take time to uh, take time to review uh, design and code. And this is something extremely important uh, because 
when we review somebody else's code, there are two benefits we get. We help make them better in their design. We also get to learn from their design as well. Now, I care a lot about this for a couple of different reasons. Now, I'll be very honest about this, and I'll admit to you right away. You can say, hey, Venkat, you talk a lot about stuff. You talk about design. You talk about code. Uh, what about your code? And I'll be very honest about it. If you look at my code, you're going to look at this and say, gosh, this is your code? Because I'll tell you, my code is crap. And I write a lot of crappy code. So I'll admit to you, I am not capable of writing good quality code. However, I'm extremely good in finding fault with other people's code. So over time, I realized, let me leverage that. Rather than pretending I can write a good quality code, I write crappy code, and I give it to a colleague. While the colleague is kicking and screaming while reviewing my code, I get to review somebody else's code. And at the end of the day, we both have better quality code. So it's actually a good thing to review code almost constantly. We learn about somebody else's code and design. We can also help them create a better quality code and design as well. So take the time to review code and design uh, continuously. And, and that can help you. Again, it's a very tactical review that I really want to do rather than a grandiose review. So what are some of the things we can do? The very first uh, principle I want to follow is the KISS principle. The KISS principle says, uh, keep it simple and stupid. Now, one of the things we have to be very careful about is our urge to create complexity. If you ask me, what is one thing I fear the most? The one thing I fear the most is complexity. We create complexity so quickly that we can't believe how much we actually end up creating. And the more complex we make things, the more difficult it becomes to modify code. So complexity makes code difficult to change. But how do we really define what simple is? And I figured a lot of us don't understand what the word simple really means. And, and that is surprising because we all talk about simplicity, but we don't know what simplicity really means. I was working with a team recently, and I kept complaining that code is complex. And one of the developers finally said, I don't get it. Why are you complaining this code is so complex? We all think it's simple. I said, you're thinking it's simple. Tell me why it's simple. And he said, because all we have is a very simple if statement repeated 50 times. And, and I, that's when I realized a lot of us don't know what simple means. In fact, the duplication of the code and the ability not to maintain it really introduce complexity and all the variations in this one piece of code. Polymorphism would have helped a lot better in this case than all these if statements, and we tend to really forget that sometimes. So what is simplicity? And I want to say, to me, simplicity is a few things. The first thing is, a simple keeps you focused. And, and that is the very, very first thing to think about. If something is simple, it keeps your focus. It doesn't distract you. It doesn't annoy you with details. For example, if you look at imperative code, imperative code confuses you. You're trying to go all over the place and trying to figure out what things are, whereas the, whereas the declarative code tells you what to do and it's easier to follow. So that is a lot simpler, of course, once we understand the syntax that is. So simple code keeps your focus. You want to really you know, create, create something simple. And the second thing to think about is a simple uh, it solves only real problem we know about. Now, how many times we see this? We have programmers writing code. Sometimes you go to a programmer and say, can I talk, to him for, talk with you for a minute? And the programmer says, no, I'm very busy. What are you doing? Well, I don't know what I'm doing, but I got to get this done now, right? So we all tend to write code so much without really taking the time to know what problem we really need to solve. So we only want to make sure we solve the problem we know about. And if we don't know much about a problem, let's wait until we know more before we write code for it. That becomes very important as well. So simple keeps our focus really well. That, that's very critical. And also, I would say, simple fails less. You want simple, some solution that simple is going to be very resilient, robust, and that becomes very important for simplicity as well. We should try to uh, you know, do that. And finally, I would say simple is easier to understand. That becomes very critical. We should be able to understand fairly well. I, I, I mean, again, I'm talking about people who you know, share the context. They should be able to really understand this. That becomes very critical for them to handle. But if you really think about it, what do we do in 
our daily lives. What we do mostly is we deal with complexity. And there are two kinds of complexities we have to deal with. One is inherent complexity, and the other is accidental complexity. Inherent complexity is the complexity from the problem domain. There is nothing you can do about it. When you're dealing with the problem, there are complexities of the problem you have to deal with. And this is the nature of the application, nature of the domain, and you have to deal with it. But fortunately or unfortunately, most of what we deal with on our daily basis is not that inherent complexity that we deal with as much. It's what we deal with is the accidental complexity. Accidental complexity often comes from the solution that we use to solve a particular problem. The solution we are using brings certain complexities into the, into the uh, table, and what do we do from there? To solve that complexity, we bring other solutions. Those solutions bring more complexity, and we get dragged into this vicious cycle very quickly, and becomes really, really hard. If you want some examples of accidental complexity, there is one we all can immediately share and think about, which is concurrency. Now think of concurrency for a minute. The application may or may not need concurrency, but the minute you bring concurrency, what do you do? You start threads. Oh great, I've got threads running, what do I do now? I want to make sure the threads do not collide with each other and start corrupting data. I've got to make sure there's no race condition in code. You start putting constructs around, like locks and synchronization. And now what happens? The code is doing a lot of stuff to keep the concurrency in place and put with all that code in place, every time we walk in to change the code, it becomes a lot more expensive to change the code as well. But where did that come from? That's an accidental complexity. The problem did not require this particular solution. It's a solution we chose to solve the problem. And if we step back and say, hey, maybe I should really think of a different solution rather than this particular problem, maybe that's a better solution. And it doesn't have these consequences of locks and synchronization. Maybe that's a better way to handle this problem. That's one question to ask. The other question to ask is, how many times do we really ask the question, what problem am I really trying to solve? And sometimes we don't even have this problem, and yet we perceive that we have this problem, and then we tend to really put solutions around it. That becomes extremely hard as well. So one of the first things I would ask programmers to do is to start recognizing if the complexity, first of all, is this complex? And don't confuse the word simple with the word familiar. And that is something we all get dragged into. Simple is not necessarily so necessarily familiar. And this is something we got to be very, very careful. Because if I write a while loop with four different variable, mutable variables in it, that while loop with four mutable variables is not simple, it is familiar. And so what's the difference between simple and familiar? Simple is something that is easier to understand. Familiar is something you, you know too well, but you're not sure if you really want to know anything more about it. And, and there's a difference between these two. For example, my in-laws. I would never use the word simple. But familiar is a very good word to use, right? So the point really is, you don't want to confuse the word simple with the word familiar. There's a very clear distinction between them. A for loop we are all used to is a familiar loop, but not necessarily a simple one, for example, or a while for that matter. Likewise, when you program in languages or things you are familiar with, well, that's what exactly it is. It's familiar, but there might be a simpler solution. Same thing with concurrency as well. I'm not familiar with maybe another solution, but that might actually be simpler than the one I'm familiar with. And so we have to really go beyond familiar to explore the simplicity. So the very first thing is ask whether something is simple or complex. If something is complex, then ask, is it an inherent complexity or is it an accidental complexity? And then we could argue that a good design, and I could say good design, is the, uh, is the one that hides inherent, uh, inherent uh, complexity and eliminates uh, the accidental uh, complexity. So in other words, really, when you want to go towards a good design, 
A good design is a design that will uh, really hide your uh, inherent complexity so that you don't have to deal with every single day and it eliminates the accidental complexity. And we have to have the courage to ask, is this a complexity I need to deal with or by removing it, does my life become a lot simpler and better? We should be willing to really get rid of those complexities that don't help us in the long run. And that takes a lot of effort to do it. So given that, I want to first start by one principle that can help us remove some of these complexity. And one such principle I've really valued over time is called the Yagni principle. And I normally attach a little Y to the very end of Yagni, and I'll tell you why I do that. The Yagni principle stands for you aren't going to need it. And you're not going to need it. Don't do it. Well, when I talk to programmers, they usually get really upset when I say you're not going to need it. I put a little Y in the very end. You're not going to need it yet. They are so happy to hear that. And they say, can I do this tomorrow? It's, yes, you can do this tomorrow. And consistently say the same thing the next day. So the point really is, you're not going to need it. So you're not going to need it yet. And we tend to implement so many things that we really don't need. And if we can take some time to ask, do I need this? I think it becomes easier to postpone things until they are really, really needed. So let's ask the question, when should I, uh, should I implement, right? And what do I implement? Implement something. So implement uh, something, whatever that is. It could be a feature. It could be just a little, little uh, you know, edge case condition I have to test. Whatever it could be, when should I implement something? Well, the first question I would ask is, uh, how much do you know? So this is a, a question we should be very realistic in asking. Because a lot of times we think we know a lot of stuff, but then once we start really asking the details, we realize we don't know as much about things. So how much do you know about what you're implementing? And then the next thing is cost of implementing uh, the, the particular feature or particular code. So let's say we're going to do it now, and let's say we're going to do it later. Let's ask the question, why should I postpone? Well, the simple reason is this. I think most of us can agree that we are smarter tomorrow than we are today. Do you agree with that? Absolutely, right? The, except I, I've not run across one person so far who disagreed with me, and nobody liked him anyways. So the point is, yes, we all are smarter tomorrow than we are today, right? So the point is, why are we smarter tomorrow than we are today? Well, we got more information about stuff. We have more data points, we hear more, we listen more, and as a result, we can make better decisions tomorrow than we can do today. So if there's something you want to implement, if that can wait until tomorrow, you would rather wait until tomorrow than implement it today. So the first question I would ask is, what's the cost of implementing this now? Let's say that's a dollar N is the cost for implementing it now, and then I'm going to say that is a lot greater than implementing it later. Well, if the implementing it now is more expensive than implementing it later, clearly postpone it. Why would you want to spend more time implementing it now, especially when you know you can wait, you would rather implement it at a later time? That's the very first thing. Well, what if the cost of implementing it now is equal to cost of implementing it later? It doesn't matter whether you do it now or do it later. Postpone one more time. Hey, what if the cost of doing it now is less than the cost of doing it uh, later on? Uh, what should I do then? Well, then ask the question, how probable uh, this is? So if it is high probability, then I would say do it now. If it is low probability, then I would say postpone. So there are good reasons why we want to postpone things to a later time. Don't misunderstand postponing to procrastination. Procrastination is not doing something that should have been done yesterday. This is what Ken Beck says. Ken Beck says, courage is postponing the decisions of tomorrow to tomorrow. And, and so we need to really have the courage to postpone things and say, you know, if I wait a little longer, I'll get a little bit more visibility into this design. And when I come back and address this design tomorrow, I can do a better job with that today, so I'm going to postpone it until I come back to that. I'll give you one example of where I see a lot of people messing up in this area. 
let's say for a minute you are starting on a design and you are going to implement seven classes that are doing something very similar to each other and then you're going to implement a top level class that's going to use these seven classes what i see programmers often do is they design one of these classes and then go brr and create these seven other classes and then they come back to the top level without asking the question is this compatible is this going to work together but if they have the courage to say you know what i've got seven classes i need to implement here but i'm going to only design one of them i'm going to design the top level class i'm going to not pretend that i don't need the other six i'm going to make this one work with this one class multiple instances and i'm going to learn about how those things fit together and once i have better understanding how these fit together then and only then will i come and create the second one i'll see how these three work together then i'll create the third one and then of course now i can create the other four so that courage that tendency is very important not to rush through and create more code in this level but to really give time so a way to think about this is something i learned from my dad when i was young uh, we would fix you know uh, in, you know put together like you know furnitures or cabinets or drawers and stuff like that and one thing he taught me very early was when you're trying to you know fit let's say a, a drawer or a cabinet when you're trying to align two pieces together as a kid what i would do is i would take the screw and tighten it really well and say this is done i'm going to go here and he would let me do it and he'll watch me and by the time i come here i'll find that these things are completely misaligned and they're not going to fit together and then he would ask allow me to you know unscrew the whole thing and then he would tell me what you need to do is you need to tighten this enough so they hold in place but not so tight that you can't really align them afterwards and i learned very quickly that you don't really tighten things very quickly you really bring them to where they barely hold together and then you align them and then you start tightening things together well a lot of this applies to software as well because when you're trying to fit multiple things together the more attention you put on one area the more misaligned it ends up being in another area and we have to really develop this technique to put multiple things together and kind of let wobble a little bit and then tighten them into it into a shape that becomes really effective for us to be able to put together as well so i'm a big fan of this yagni principle it's a controversial principle some people don't agree with it but again people don't agree with this about anything in life these days so the point is that yagni simply says you know don't really do something until you really find value in doing it and i use it as a tool to postpone things until i have a very clear reason to implement it i remember uh, pairing up with a developer writing some code and as we were writing test and writing code test and writing code i was in the middle of writing code to make a test to pass and right in the middle of that coding i said to myself oh wait i got to handle this condition and brr, i wrote a little code He immediately elbows me and says, "Hey, Venkat, are you not supposed to finish the code you are working on, make the current test to pass, then write a test that fails because of that condition, and then come back and write that code?" I'm like, "Yes, of course, I'm supposed to do that." And I, un, you know, take away the code I wrote and only focused on the problem on hand. So now the test is passing with the minimum code. Then the next thing I did was I wrote the test for that edge case I wanted to handle. I write the test case and remember I have to make the test to fail before I write the code. So I ran the test and I was pretty shocked as he was. We both noticed that the test actually is passing. So we both were like, "How? Huh? Why would the test pass?" And he leans over to me and says, "Did you, you know, sneak back and put the code in there while I turned the other side?" It's like, "No, I told me not to write it. I was, you know, not. I'm, I didn't write it." And we go into the code and clearly the code doesn't handle it. and we both were a bit surprised and then we started a little digging into it and we found out that the function we were calling in the code that library function was already handling the situation how naive of me to write this code when the code is already doing it what a waste of time and effort again the yagni kind of kicks in i don't have to do this the test is very important because tomorrow if i refactor the code i don't call the underlying code well my code may not handle the situation the test becomes a garden 
engine to tell me that the code is not handling at the time. So the test is definitely important, but I shouldn't be writing the code because it's already being done at another level. It's a waste of time and waste of effort writing that code. It's a duplication of effort as well. So that is something we have to be very comfortable with is not doing stuff that we don't need to do. This also comes to features in languages as well, sorry, features in applications as well, where we should boldly say, I don't want to implement this feature yet. We'll wait until we learn more about this and prioritize the features and implement it. So, so postpone until you no longer can postpone. But having said that, I do want to uh, mention one thing. Uh, why don't we postpone? That is one thing I want to emphasize. Why don't we postpone? I'll give you an example of this and, and, and say why this is very critical. I was working on an application. I had exactly six months of development time. That's all my budget was. That's all my uh, time available was. So I had a six-month six schedule. The, the day I started this, the very first thing I knew was I would need a database. And the mere thought of installing a database was so boring. And I said to myself, I don't want a database. I just want to get my work done. And I realized I'm going to change this particular schema so many times in the six months. I don't want the burden of a database to slowing me down. So I decided I'm going to use SQLite 3 which is insane. Nobody would ever go to production with SQLite 3. It's a file-based database, but guess what? It is so easy to work with. I can blow it away a thousand times in a day and recreate it automated scripts. And I, so I decided this. And I was literally two weeks before going into production. Two weeks before. And I haven't decided the database at that point. And if you ask me honestly, I was very nervous that time. And, and, and this is the point where it's no longer the last responsible moment. It was an irresponsible moment, right? And, and, but you may ask me, why did you postpone that long? There were two reasons for it. The first reason I postponed it is that I really wanted the agility of not having to deal with the database and be able to evolve my model. Uh, uh, the second reason is I wanted to decide which cloud environment I'm going to deploy this in. And depending on the cloud I choose, they may have certain pricing and other limitations on databases I could use. And I don't want to make the decision way too early. Well, guess what? Two weeks before going to production, every single decision has been made already. I knew exactly where I was going to put it on the cloud. I know what service I'm going to use. I don't have a database. And I remember coming to work that morning, and I said to myself, I'm not going to take phone calls today. I'm not going to look at email. My job today is one thing. Commit to the database, convert the code over. If I don't do it today, I'm in trouble. So I sit down with my code. I run all my tests. Everything is passing. And I take the production type database, bring a development environment into it, convert all the configurations. I said, run the test. And guess what? As soon as I run the test, three or four tests completely failed. And that moment is called the moment of panic. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my test is failing. What do I do? I want to call my mom, right? And I was like, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, two more weeks for schedule. What, what, what do I do? I'm like, calm down, Venkat. And all I did, honestly, I copied the error message, entered into Google, clicked the message, first entry on Stack Overflow. It says, if you see this, your data type has a wrong format. Oh, OK. And what did I do? I reverted all my change, went back to SQLite, made that one change that Stack Overflow says I should do, run all my tests, and guess what? All my tests still run with my old database. I said, this is cool. Now flip the configuration back, production type database and development, run all the tests, all the tests pass. Check in, never look back again. So the point really is, it is a panic, all right. And I'm like, oh my gosh, the world is over. But calm down, what's the problem? Well, the problem is this. Why do we make, why don't we postpone? And I'll tell you the one reason why we, are, we don't postpone. We, we are scared, right? This is the true reason. We are scared. What happens when you start developing applications? You beat the heck out of the application by testing it. And we test and test and test and test every day. But if we do manual testing 
And if somebody comes to you in the end and says, let's change, what, is, what do you first say? Are you crazy, right? That's the very first thing you're going to tell them, right? Because we don't have time to test this stuff. Are you crazy to change anything right now? However, if you have a fairly good automated testing, and if somebody says, uh, in the end, let's uh, change, and what are you going to say? Give it a try, right? So there's a very big difference in the way you're going to respond to. So I realized the Yagni principle is not really great if all we have is a very poor feedback loop. And this is where a lot of these things kind of intertwine and connect together. So to me, a good design is a design that's automatically verifiable as well. If I don't have an automatic verification, then all I can do in the end is curl up in a corner and cry, right? That's all I can do, because there's no way I have a feedback loop, and then the boss comes to you and says, what do you keep talking about this thing called testing? Release it. If it doesn't work, the users will let you know, right? And then we kind of release software and then have the consequences of it. So to me, automated testing is very critical. So if you want uh, to postpone uh, to the last response moment, uh, we need to have a good automated uh, testing, right? So that becomes extremely critical, and without it, it's very difficult to postpone things to a later time, and we tend to make decisions way too early, and when we do, what happens? We are you know, stuck with the consequences of the decisions we make, and that comes back, back to haunt us. So given that, let's talk about a few other principles we can value really well. The one principle that is so fundamental to what we do is the principle of cohesion. So what is cohesion? Cohesion is where a piece of code is narrow, focused, and does one thing and one thing well. So narrow, fo narrow, focused, and does one thing and one thing well is called a cohesive code. So a cohesive code is a code that is not taking on several responsibilities. It is focused on doing one thing. Now, why is that very important? Well, the reason is very simple if you really think about it. So what we want is, we want software uh, to change, but uh, not uh, too expensive, right, to change. So in other words, if a code is cohesive, so code is cohesive, it has to, so it has to change uh, less frequently. So this is one of the biggest benefits you get out of cohesive code. So let's say a piece of code does seven different things. You go to this code and say, what do you do? It says, I can do all those things. This is awesome. When do you change? I change every single day. Because I do all of it, which means I got to change constantly. Well, on the other hand, if a code does only one thing, and it doesn't do anything, it says, I am focused, narrow. I'm good at only one thing. That's all I'm going to do. Hey, when do you change? Well, occasionally, whenever that part has to change. So if you have one piece of code that does seven things, that one module has to constantly change, which is more expensive because when a programmer comes to change it, they got to make sure they don't break other things that are not really being affected, and that becomes very expensive. On the other hand, when a piece of code, you break it into seven pieces where each piece does one thing and one thing well, well, the cost of changing it is much easier because you walk in, it's cohesive, it's very easy. Let me give you an example of cohesion that I've learned really the hard way. I have very good parents. They tried really hard to teach me cohesion as a child. They, they started very early to teach me cohesion. They could never succeed with it. Well, I would go out and play and have a good time. I would come back from school with a boatload of stuff. And the minute I come home, it was so much fun to go out and play on the streets. And the fastest way to go from coming from school to go back to the streets to play is to dump what you have on your hand into your closet. Because if you have to put stuff in the closet, that takes time. So I would open the closet, throw my bag in there, throw my sock in there, throw my shirt in there, and run. And this was the most fastest way to get out. And this worked really well. I don't know why parents keep complaining, right? And, but the problem was this. This was the fastest to throw things into the closet. But the time I needed a sock, that was a different story. Hey, I found a blue sock. 
I could not find the next blue sock. This is one reason why you need to have a lot of younger brothers and sisters. Then you can have an army of people searching for you, right? <laughs> and if you find a blue sock, the next one is not a blue sock, and you're struggling with it. And this was a complete mess, because when I go to get my sock, that's when I'll find a book I lost for a long time. And you may say, my gosh, this looks horrible, Venkat. How did things turn out? I got married. All that got fixed, <laughs> right? So the beauty of this is, I can't do with my wife what I did with my parents, right? Parents are so golden, they're, they're awesome. But anyway, now if you come to my house, you will see completely different setup. Socks are in one place, underwears in completely different place, and then books far away from either one of them, right? This is called cohesion. Like things are together, unlike things are far apart from each other. And the kitchen utensil, Thankfully, in the kitchen. The other day, I've got a teenager. The other day, my son kind of quietly walks over, and he's gathering a lot of utensils. And then slowly, he's going. My wife is like, stop. What are you doing? I'm going to my room. Not with those things, right? He's trying to create a kitchen in his room, right? No, no, no. no it doesn't work here. The kitchen doesn't stay here in the kitchen. Well, that's called cohesion. So cohesion is where like things stay together and unlike things stay apart. Well, the same thing with code. A code that deals with a database different from a code that deals with XML processing, very far away from code that's dealing with UI. And so this becomes a lot more cohesive to work with. That's basically the idea behind cohesion. So cohesion lowers the cost of developing software. So you want to make sure that like things are together, unlike things are to, uh, away from each other. But the second thing to think about is coupling. So what is coupling? Coupling is the degree of connectivity among things. So you, when your code is talking to other pieces of code, that always increases coupling. So a way to think about coupling is, uh, coupling is essentially uh, what you depend on. There is one coupling that is probably the worst form of coupling. Uh, that is uh, one thing we all use, which is called inheritance. Uh, inheritance actually increases coupling quite a bit because it's very rigid. And when I talk about inheritance here, I'm talking about the Java style of inheritance, not the JavaScript style of inheritance. JavaScript uses prototypal inheritance, which is a lot better, but I'm talking about the traditional class-based inheritance. So inheritance increases coupling. Now, one of the things you should really try to do is, first, try to see if you can, you, you can remove coupling. Because if you can remove coupling, that is a lot better than anything else you can do. And honestly, we take problems and we simply assume we have to deal with these coupling. Uh, I'll give you an example of this. I was in a conference, which was more of an open space conference, and I saw developers talking about how they all really, really like doing automated testing, but why automated testing really comes to hurt them because it becomes very difficult to change the code over time. I was listening to this quietly for a little bit, and then I said, hey guys, maybe you're having trouble with testing because your design sucks. And by saying that, I made an enemy of everybody in the room. And they all looked at me and said, who are you? Why do you say our design sucks? I said, because I create a lot of design that sucks. I thought you guys are like me. And, um, and, then, um, and then they said, well, explain to us why, what would you do differently? So I said, explain to me a problem. And they explained to me a problem and said, here's the problem we're trying to solve. Here's the dependency. What do you do with it? And after discussing for a few minutes, we redesigned this and completely removed the dependency out of it. So we didn't have to really do any mocking because there was no dependency. When you have no dependency, you don't have to do any mocking. Well, at the end of the conference, I decided to blog about it. And my blog was essentially knock out before you mock out. And the idea really is, you know, don't keep mocking when you can simply knock out your dependencies instead of mocking it out. Well, after the conference, half the people told me, hey, this is an interesting thought. I'm going to go back to work tomorrow and retry my design. The other half was still mad at me. I cannot help that. So the point really is, we really want to remove dependency first as much as we can. But be careful. Uh, can't remove all the dependencies, right? And that's something we got to keep in mind. We cannot. If you remove all the dependencies, the system will be so stable, it won't even run. So eventually, you have to have some dependencies. So then what can we do? Well, there are a couple of different ways to think about dependency. So first is get rid of it. And the second is uh, make it loose. So in other words, if you can, make, make it 
uh, loose instead of a uh, tight coupling. So what is a tight coupling? So depending uh, on a class, so depending on a class uh, is tight coupling. So as much as possible, you want to be able to depend less. So depending on an interface is loose coupling. Uh, use caution. I always have to say this. So you don't want to just throw in interfaces without regard to whether you need it or not. But in general, though, depending on an interface's loose coupling, depending on a class is more of a tight coupling, you want to reduce coupling. So the short answer to this is a good design has high cohesion uh, and low coupling. So that's something you got to keep in mind. A good design has high cohesion and it has low coupling. And as much as you can, when you're designing software, you want to tend to move towards it where you want to increase cohesion, where things are really focused and narrow and you want to lower or loosen your coupling as much as you can. And so when we look at design, we can constantly ask the question, is this cohesive? Is this coupling that I can reduce or can I eliminate? And we can constantly evaluate that as part of the design as well. So given this, we talked about you know, cohesion and coupling. So you want high cohesion and low coupling for a good design. But what are some of the ways to deal with coupling? Well, one way is to eliminate it, like I said. The other way is to reduce coupling by depending on an interface rather than, pardon me, uh, depending on a, on, a, on a class, and that can help you to reduce the coupling as much as you can. And of course, the worst kind of coupling you want to definitely avoid is cyclic coupling that becomes really uh, hard to maintain. You want to get rid of that. So now we talked about some very, very basic principles. Avoid doing work until you no longer can avoid it. That's the first principle, YAGNI. The second is make the code more cohesive and make it loosely coupled as much as you can, increase cohesion and lower coupling. That's something that can help us a great deal. But if you look at one thing we do constantly, we have enormous amount of duplicated code. And we see this every single day. And sometimes we duplicate code without even realizing we are duplicating code. The other day I was working on something, I wanted to implement a new feature, within five minutes it was working. And I was so happily coding away, and I stopped and said, wait, that worked too quickly. And I realized I was not thinking. And then I looked at the code, no wonder I had copied and pasted and gone through. And I like, really had to you know, give me a slap and say, don't do this again, right? So the point is we tend to you know, copy and paste stuff without even realizing sometimes it becomes a second nature. Now, why is duplicating code such a bad idea? Well, first of all, I want to talk about dry before I talk about it. So what does dry mean? So dry stands for don't repeat. Uh, so don't repeat yourself. So that's the very first thing, uh, don't repeat. Well, it's often mistaken, and I mentioned this a few times already myself, it's often mistaken that we are focused on duplication of code. Well, we talk about that quite often, but this is a lot more than duplication of code. So what does Dry really say? Dry says, don't duplicate, and don't duplicate two things. One, code, so that's the first thing, code, uh, and also effort. So don't duplicate code, don't duplicate effort. Now, when we duplicate code and duplicate effort, it comes back to haunt us. Duplication of code is something we all recognize very quickly. But let's think of duplication of effort before we come back to talk about duplication of code. Now, imagine for a minute you have an application where you make a change to the database schema. And the minute you change the database schema, you decide that you have to change your HPM file. OK, you change your HPM file. What's the next thing? I got to change my you know, mod model class here. I got to change my DIO class here. I got to change my controller here. I got to change my view here. And then when you're done with all the change, you say, boy, there was a lot of change, but that's life in the big city. What can I do? Well, but where did all the change start? All the change started with the change to the schema. And so that is an example of a duplication of effort. It's not the same code we wrote in each of these places, but it is a different code, but the effort started by making that one change. Here is another example. You, are, you need to perform a validation on your application. Well, for performing this validation, you got to do client-side validation and server-side validation. Now, clearly, we all can agree 
You don't do client-side validation and go home. You have to do both server-side and client-side always if they're going to do client-side because you can sneak behind this client and get to the data on the server-side. You got, to, got validation on both sides. Well, okay, but on the server-side, I got to write Java. On the client-side, I need JavaScript. After all, it's two different languages. What can I do? I'm going to write the code in both places. Well, that's a duplication of effort, even though it's not the same code you are duplicating. And it's important for us to take some time to say, how can I capture this, which is exactly what the dry is talking about. So what does the dry principle say? It says every piece of knowledge uh, in a system, so knowledge in a system, should have a single unambiguous, ambiguous, um, authoritative representation. So it says every piece of knowledge, and after all, we are knowledge workers, every piece of knowledge in a system should have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation. This was written in the Pragmatic Programmers, a fantastic book if you haven't had a chance to look at it, but uh, Pragmatic Programmers talk about the dry principle, we should not duplicate effort, we should not duplicate a code as well. Now, I remember my painful experience from my past. I was working on an application where uh, a server side, a simulator that I was working with, uh, would choke up and fail when a certain data is sent. And I was eager to make sure this doesn't you know, happen, so I was in charge of developing the UI, and in the UI, I had gone in to verify that this kind of stale, you know, incorrect data doesn't get through. Well, a few months went by, one of the engineers fixed the problem on the server side and tried to enter the data, and the UI said, sorry, we don't permit this. It's like, yeah, we do, and he filed a, a bug for fixing it. It took us several months to fix it. Now, why did it take us several months to fix it? Because in my eagerness to solve this problem, I had spread this code across the UI every single place. And you know that's really bad programming. You say, gosh, that's really bad. Well, but isn't that what experience is all about? Experience is where you do all the bad things before your luck runs out, right? So I had done this, and I learned about this, and it's like, oh, eventually, like, that's a really bad pro programming. Don't do it. And we begin to learn quickly and say, how do we eliminate this problem? Well, create a little code that becomes the value validator and call this validator from different places so it doesn't really become more expensive to change this code. So what does the dry principle do? It reduces uh, the cost of development. Now, how many times we see configurations being duplicated? And it's a nightmare. You probably have seen places where you go to configure something, and people spend enormous amount of time doing the same configurations in multiple places. That is a sign when we got too much duplication going on. We got to find a way to write scripts and eliminate that kind of duplication. That's very important. Now, one of the reasons I would like to do this is, so why should we care? So that's the first question, should we care? And I'm going to say this. Um, I, like I said earlier, I write a lot of crappy code. But occasionally, though, I get uh, you know, kind of better at some point. And I remember this other day, I was writing a piece of code, and I had to implement a certain feature. I come in. And I found that a lot of things has fallen in place. And it was like, wow, this is awesome. Here's the code already modularized. All I have to do is call it from here. And I really said, this is awesome because I had removed the duplication and I had refactored it. This falls in place really nicely. So here is one of the reasons I really like to write better quality code. And the reason is, the future you will thank you. So this is really a great thing to have. Because usually, my future me usually curses me. And to be able to have the future you to thank you is really no no noble, right? So the future you thanks you, and you're like, wow, good job. You did really well back in those days on, on that day when you were doing the design. That can help you quite a bit as well. So that's one of the reasons to do really better design. Uh, I was talking to a developer, uh, uh, and, and I'm asking him how the system is. And he said, you know what? This is really horrible because we have this code, and uh, this every two months, we are fixing the same bug over and over. I said, oh my gosh, you're fixing the same bug every two months. Does somebody in your company actively put the bug back in when you fix it? He said, no, no, no. This code is duplicated in so many places. We keep discovering it every two months. I said, oh, that sucks. Uh, what, what, what do you think? He's like, yeah, absolutely, it sucks. And I said, so when you do discover this, you take a few minutes to refactor and remove the duplication, right? He thought for a minute and said, 
that's a great idea, right? I mean, how do you fix it if you never ever take the time to remove the duplication that can be really problematic? So every time you see the duplication, we have to take the time to refactor the code and remove the duplication as well. That becomes extremely important. So we want to really remove the duplication in code as much as we can, so keep it dry. So every piece of knowledge in a system should have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation. We, do, you know, we are scared about code generations a lot of times, but I think we're not using it enough at the same time. I think if we use a code generation in a controlled manner, we can have code being generated on the client side maybe from a single unambiguous authoritative representation. We can remove this, those duplications as well and make it easier to maintain software. So we talked about keeping things dry and removing duplication of code there are tools you could use for checking for duplication of code. For example, there's one tool called uh, CPD, which stands for Copy Paste Detector. There's also a tool called Simeon. The word Simeon means monkey. That means you've been monkeying with code. If you copied and pasted it several places. So you can use tools to look for detect uh, copy paste detection as well. And it can be fairly smart in detecting uh, convoluted code that's copied as well. And we can remove some of these duplications. Well, we talked about uh, the dry principle and, and to remove these kinds of duplication. But how do we manage to remove duplication? I often tend to not create abstractions. I often tend to not create functions when I sit down to write code. What I instead often do is I often tend to refactor code on the second time that I really need it. And this gives me a nice balance between creating way many, too many things. Remember YAGNI principle? I don't want to do what I don't have to do now. And on the other hand, going around duplicating stuff and making it more complicated, it's a nice balance, I think. So postpone until, and then when you start see the first sign that you need it somewhere else, that's a great time for you to remove the duplication as well. So the next thing I want to talk about here is probably a, a very important principle that most of us need to really pay more attention to, much more than we no normally do, in my opinion. And that is the single responsibility principle. Now, you may argue single responsibility, responsibility principle is just a rewording of cohesion, and to a great extent, it is. So cohesive code has a single responsibility. But I think it's a good idea to just spend a little bit of time thinking about single responsibility principle, because oftentimes what I find out is, when you are writing a class, it's very easy for us to start writing methods into a class. But if I ask the question, what is the primary responsibility of this class? Or what's the primary responsibility of this method? And if the answer is, this class does this and, or this method does this and, that and is a giveaway. It's doing way too many things than it should. And these principles are not really isolated from each other. Oftentimes, in, uh, violating one principle may actually violate another principle as well. And so they kind of go hand in hand quite a few times. But talking about single responsibility, we want to make sure we are able to define this is the primary responsibility of this function, and we can focus on that responsibility. Let's think about easy places where we often see this being violated. Let's talk about long methods for a minute. Let me ask you this question. Who here, raise your hand if you do, who here thinks long methods are great idea? Not a single person I could see in my view here. So nobody thinks long methods are a great idea. Well, generally, there's usually one person always, right, raises the hand. I would ask them, why do you think long methods are good? And they would tell you, because it gives you better performance. Well, they're not actually wrong. But the last time they were wrong, Nixon was the president. A lot of things have changed since then. Different architecture, different compiler technology, so those things hold, don't hold true anymore. Let me ask you a different question. How many of you see long methods of code almost on a daily basis? Look at that, right? Almost all the hands go up. Now, this is called cognitive dissonance. We all know this is wrong, and yet we see it. But I got some good news for you. I know where those long methods came from. Nobody here wrote those methods. Because a few minutes ago, you told me you don't think long methods are a good idea. So it cannot be you. The people who write long methods are at work now 
making those methods longer as we speak, right? <laughs> so nobody here did that. So, you know, what can we do? So we know it's a wrong thing, but still there are people going around who believe that long methods are a good idea. Well, I was at a client side looking at a piece of code. And you know, I'm a consultant, I go into client sites often, have to read code quickly and come up to terms. And I started reading this code. And I'm not kidding with you, right? I wanted to really read and understand the code. So I start reading the code. Line one, done. Line two, line three. I'm just reading happily. And a few minutes later, I realized, I'm not sure how much there is more. So I said, before reading the code, let me see how much there is. So I hold the down key. That keeps going. I'm like, OK, that's not ending. Now I page down. That's still going. I'm like, that's not helping. So I went all the way back. And I did a matching of the curly braces. And I had to really do a little math to find out how many lines are between them. And that's when it's like, where's the dearest door, right? So here's a question for you. Longest method you have seen, number of lines. 14,000. What is it? 14,000. <laughs> did you say 40,000? Do you work in hell? <laughs> I'm not going to ask anybody to beat it. <laughs> Let's all put our head down for a minute. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm not even going to ask you that. <sighs> I need some water. <laughs> 40,000. <laughs> and he says, that's only in one function. <laughs> so. When you have long functions, have you noticed this? Long function, do you see this? You know, some comment, and then you have a lot of these comments. And then you see, you know, code in between comments. So you got code, and all these wonderful code sitting right here in between comments. And then you have more comment and more code. And then you have more comment, more code. And then more comment, more code. Have you seen this pattern? This is the pattern of long methods, right? And I always looked at this and said, why is it like this? And I finally figured the reason. And the reason is, the people who wrote those long methods are bad programmers. But they're not bad humans. Deep down, they have empathy. And they said, what if someday some clown comes to look at this code, right? And so to just clear their guilt, they put a few comments in there. And they say, it's not that bad after all, right? <laughs> and so that's the reason why you see these comments. These are really good places to extract methods out of. That's a very common symptom of long, met long methods. But let's talk about this for a minute. Long methods are bad. Well, you all said it's bad, uh, that you don't think it's a good idea. But I'll ask you the question, why? Why is it really bad? Hard to test, what a noble thought. Hard to test. Uh, hard to test, why? Because the number of permutation and combination you have to go through, it's just unbelievable. So as a result, you say, do as much as you can, and I'll leave it to others, right? They can take care of it. If it doesn't work, they'll let you know. Okay, what else? Hard to read. Hard to read. Very difficult to read, yep. Hard to remember. Hard to remember. <laughs> OK. All right. <laughs> what else? Well, what was it? Obscured business rule. Uh, business rules. Uh, hard to reuse. What a great idea. I'm going to add one more to it. Leads to duplication. These two go hand in hand. How so? Oh, here's a long method. Oh my gosh, right there in the middle. I want to reuse that code. What can I do? You can't get it. <laughs> so what am I going to do? Copy it and paste it into another long method. My job here is done, right? So these two work hand in hand. They are hard to reuse, but they lead to duplication as well. What else? Many reasons to change. One, sorry, say it again. Many reasons to change. Oh yeah, many reasons to change. If anything has to change, the function is like, I'm here, right? Come change me. Absolutely, they change a lot. What else? Uh, can't be optimized by anything, not just the JVM, right? Yep. 
Lots oh. of Say that again. Lot of variables and okay. <laughs> Knowledge as well. What else? No, not developer friendly. <laughs> what else is this? Uh, friendly. Uh, mixed levels. So, um, lacks cohesion. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. What does it do? Better question. What does it not do? <laughs> right? It does everything. And so, this is low cohesion and high, usually high coupling. You think the code is going to come alone? It's going to say, join the party. And it's going to be a lot of things. This is the diagonal opposite of good design, isn't it? Good design says high cohesion and low coupling. Long methods say low cohesion and high coupling, right? It's a diagonal opposite of what a good design could be, and yet we do this. What else can we think of? Uh, obsolete comments. Maybe, absolutely. A lot of times it is. Many dependencies. Yeah, that's coupling. Many dependencies. Hard to debug, isn't it? How do you debug this code? You know the person who is invited to debug that code, you know what their title is called? Victim. <laughs> right? That's what it is. It's like, why me? Why me? Why don't you go ask him to do it today, right? We have this all the time. And the list keeps going on, right? So we can keep saying more things, why these things are really, really bad. And yet, we see long methods every day. If there is one thing, just one thing, just one thing, if we can do in our field to improve, I think that would be long methods. And anytime somebody shows me long method, I'm like, why, why, how did people let you do this? Where were they when you were committing this crime? So there is absolutely no reason to have long methods. So we definitely want to remove all these long methods. And you are telling me, hey, hey, Venkat, but remember what you said a few minutes ago? We know this already. We don't do this. It's the people at work who are doing this. So I've got a last ditch effort, one last effort to convince them. I know you have tried them, tried before. You have told this person not to write long methods but I'll give you one last suggestion. So go to work on Monday, don't say a word. Just sit down and start coding. And this person, the one who writes long methods, comes to work and says, hey, how was your weekend? You could have said, oh, the weekend was great. I went to the park on Saturday and went to the movie on Sunday. But don't say that. Instead say, oh, the weekend. Exactly at seven o'clock, I drove the car out of the garage, took a left turn took a right turn, drove for seven kilometers, stopped the stop sign, took a right turn. Oh, there was a bird on the uh, a tree when it was raining, but that was horrible. But anyway, I took a right turn, went another for three kilometers, took, went round the roundabout, took the third right from the roundabout, went another three kilometers. Just keep going like this for as long as you can go. And at some point, your colleague says, have you gone mad? You say, no, I thought I'll tell you how my weekend was like you write code. Right? So the point is, we, we don't write code like that. We don't speak like that. Well, how do you speak? I went to the park on Saturday and movie on Sunday. Your colleague could say, oh, really? Which park did you go to? Hey, notice, your colleague is not interested in the movie. What to talk about park? Oh, the park near the main street. Oh, yeah. Is that a family-friendly park? Now the colleague wants to know about the you know, behavior, the nature of the park, not where it is. Oh yeah, I took the kids over there. What kind of facilities do they have in there? Now we are going deeper and deeper into it. Somebody mentioned the word level earlier, and that is something to think about. Well, let's understand that a little bit. So let's ask the question, how long is a long method? Well, I'm going to say, the, we know one thing is very long, right? <laughs> we have set that standard very clearly today, right? So that clearly is to us. But let's go with something little, you know, less than that. What do you think? 1,000 is long? All right. 500 is long? All right. 100 is long? 50 is long? 25 is long? I see a few people doing this now. 
They think 25 is okay, and a few people are like, really? Okay. What about 10? It depends on who the closure guy in the room is, right? <laughs> so, so this is never going to win, right? Numbers are not going to count. Here's another idea. I'm going to say a function is small enough if you can see the entire function in a window. And the last time I said this, somebody said, what's your font size? Okay, that doesn't work either. Okay, damn. Well, okay. So what do you do? I think we should resort to a slap. No, don't get physically violent. This means single level of abstraction principle. So the key is not how long your function is. The question to ask is, what is the level of abstraction of your uh, function? How was your weekend? Went to the park on Saturday and the movie on Sunday. Now notice the level of abstraction here. Where did you go to? Not what are the details about the places you went to. We humans, when we communicate, at least meaningfully, that's how we communicate, right? You give chunk of information that is in a level of abstraction, and you let people decide which way to go before you get into deeper things. You don't say, uh, you know, things like, I went to the movies on uh, Saturday and cut the limbs, seven limbs on my tree in my garden and go through all these minor details and then say, uh, you know, Sunday on, uh, you know, uh, movie on Sunday. Well, you probably say, went to the movies on Saturday, uh, you know, went to the uh, park on Saturday, did some gardening on Sunday, uh, Saturday afternoon, and again, you keep at a high level of abstraction. So this principle says, you want to, when you write code, focus on a single level of abstraction. And when you do a single level of abstraction, you are keenly focused on only keeping the code in that level of abstraction. What might be really useful when you're writing a function is to put a word, not a comment, but just a word which will go away to simply say, what's my abstraction in this function? And then you can rename the function with the name of the abstraction itself. So the code becomes the comment rather than a comment being there. I want to emphasize that a little bit. Uh, about good design as well, you already mentioned the word comment a few times, so I want to talk about commenting. I have to really say, I hate comments. And I really do hate comments. And, and again, this is a controversy. People disagree with me quite a bit. But I'll tell you why I hate comments. The reason I hate comments is, oftentimes, the comments are used to cover up bad code. And if somebody tells me, I don't understand this code, comment it, I say, wait, 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 I don't understand this code, refactor it. I don't want to comment the bad code, I want to refactor a bad code. When done with that, I want the comment still to be there, but do not. So don't comment, uh, comment, uh, comment uh, what, instead comment why. So I want to know why this code exists. Why did you do this? That is not there in the code. The code tells me what it is doing. I don't need a comment. I can read the code and understand, if not, make the code readable. Well, when it comes to this, when you comment large methods, when you comment code, which is convoluted, there is another risk. There are times when the code deviates from the comment. I'm, I'm sure we all have seen that, right? Somebody said, you know, obsolete comment. This happens quite a bit. The code does one thing and the comment does something else, and you're not sure which way to go now, and that becomes really uh, frustrating also. So to me, a good code, what is a good design? Well, a code lives a design, so a good code is like a joke. Now, here is something you need to keep in mind. You, when you tell a joke, the worst thing you can ever do is explain a joke. <laughs> this is a life's lesson, right? You tell a joke, and everybody's like staring at you. And the worst thing is, let me explain to you. <laughs> this is a very long afternoon, right? It's going to be really hard. And then when you explain it, they look at you and say, yeah, what's funny about it? Let me explain more, right? This is when you have to leave the room. So what do you do? You say a joke, and people just don't get it. They're staring at you. The right response is only one word, never mind. And then you just walk away with your head up, right? This did not work with these people. And then you go home, quietly sit down, and you refactor your joke. 
and then you try it again with a new set of people and see how it goes. And you never you know, explain a joke, you always refactor it. Well, that's exactly the point with code as well. You never comment the code, you always refactor the code. So a code is like a joke, just refactor it if it doesn't work. So it should be really easy to understand what the code is doing, what it's saying, that becomes extremely important. So then we can comment on the why and not the uh, what, and that becomes easy. So keep the uh, code uh, to the single level of abstraction. Well, that then takes us to what is called a compose method pattern. Well, the compose method pattern says a code should be composed of the steps that you want to take in developing this particular code's logic. So, for example, here is a compose method. What do you do on, over the weekend? I went to the park on Saturday, went to the movies on Sunday. That is composing. So when you read the code, the code should be telling you the story of what the code is doing rather than being cryptic and hard to understand. So the code should be nicely composed of these steps that you're following. And that code itself becomes so-called self-documented code. So it's easier to understand what the code is doing. And so once you write the code in an easier to understand manner, then you are not really pulling in comments to support for a bad code. The code becomes self-documenting as well. And you can use the compose method pattern. So when it comes to this, for example, I was recently working on a piece of code where I have to do a certain processing of you know, coupons. And the key is this. You're not going to look at this code today, but you're going to look at this code five months from now, six months from now. And when you look at this code, how much of that you're going to remember about this code? And my experience is very little. After a few weeks, you even begin to question if you wrote it or if aliens came and wrote it when you were sleeping, right? And so you're looking at this code and you're like, gosh, did I even write this? And so if you use the compose method pattern, you have a logical flow of what's going on in the code. And, and that keeps consistent with the working code. Well, we could achieve the same thing with comments as well, but oftentimes the comments became stale and we lose sight of it over time because we are you know, trying to change the code. We don't change the comment properly. But there's another problem also. Um, writing is very hard for a lot of us. And we already struggle to write code. How do we write comments? And English comments or any language comments can be very ambiguous as well. And you're reading it, and it means one to you, means something else to somebody else. Whereas a code, if you have a fairly good amount of testing, you can run the code and say, hey, the code doesn't pass this test. What did I do when I changed this code? It gives you a quick feedback to know what's going on. So that can help you quite a bit as well to get that kind of feedback. So what we did so far is we talked about the single responsibility principle and, and how we can really uh, think about writing code. So long methods are the number one target of this. But this doesn't stop in long methods. Classes are victims for this as well. So when you look at a class, you ask yourself, what does this class really do? And the answer is, this class is doing these many things. Maybe I should break this into smaller classes. And then maybe I should create an abstraction from it rather than having all these responsibilities in this class. So one thing I normally do is I always combine single responsibility principle with the next principle I'll talk about a little bit later, which is the open closed principle. I often say this class has more responsibility than it should, and as a result, the frequency with which I have to change is higher. And when I do make a change to it, the code is not going to be extensible. And so it's a really nice way to you know, reason that. When I work with developers, we normally don't say, I don't like this code or I like this code. Oftentimes, it's like, you know what? This code suffers from this particular uh, principle being violated. Hey, you're violating the single responsibility principle here. You should apply YAGNI here. Don't do this. Remove this code. I actually uh, encourage developers to remove code. I'll, I'll tell you about this myself. Uh, this is hard. We all are humans, and we go through this. I took an, a 20-hour flight, and in the entire flight, I decided to implement a feature. And so I started working on it in the beginning of the flight. It was a fairly complex uh, feature. It took me almost the entire flight to implement it. And 20 hours later, I land in my destination, check into the hotel, and by that time, I knew one thing very clearly. My code and design sucks. And I was sitting here at the hotel, and it was a really tough time because a part of me was saying, delete it. And the other part is like, don't listen to him. You spent all this time writing it and keep it. And after a few minutes of struggle, I took the courage to poof, delete it. 
and it felt so good that it was gone. And then I started rewriting it. It only took me two hours to rewrite it because, of course, I've learned along the way with all the things I learned, and the design was a lot better. I won't say it's perfect, but it was a lot better than what I did before. So the biggest courage is to delete one's own code. So if you delete code and start over, well, Frederick Brooks said, go ahead and build a software, and when you are done with it, delete it and start over. Well, you can't do this in a project. If you do this in a project, that's the easiest way to get fired, right? But at every single piece of code we write, little functions we write, little features we write, don't tell anybody. Just delete it and start over and see what happens. And I don't think we are deleting our own code as often than we should. And if we do, I think we would have a much better design than we do today. And so, you know, apply these principles along the way. And, and like I said, you cannot really do this correctly in one sitting. You're learning a great deal when you're writing the code. Take notes of it and say, you know what? I created this design, but here are the things that are good in the design. Here are the things that suck and I'm going to rewrite it to really fix those things. Get a second opinion as well, have somebody review it, and then go back and make it better, and that can be really, really rewarding. Um, what I'm going to do next is I've got a few more principles to talk about, and I'm going to talk about open-close principle, the scarf subscription principle, the dependency inversion principle, and then the interface segregation principle as well. So we got quite a few things ahead of us. Uh, I would like to take a 15-minute break. I'll start sharply in 15 minutes. Thank you. All right, let's get started. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about a few more principles here. Again, these principles are some things that I've found extremely valuable. And the next one is a principle uh, coined by Bertrand Meyer, and he talks about the so-called open-closed principle. So what is open-closed principle? It says a software module, whether it's a class, a method, uh, a component, whatever it could be, uh, uh, should be open for extension, but closed from modification. So this is a really a, a very important principle. And I see this principle being violated so often, I can uh, believe how many times we actually violate this principle. So in other words, this really comes back to the cost of change how much effort and time and money it's going to ch uh, cost to uh, change the software. So open close principle says an, a software module must be open for extension, meaning it should be able to do a little bit more than what it did before, but it should be closed from modification. Now that appears like a magic. How can you make a module do something it doesn't do, uh, but without changing it? Well, actually, this is where Two things are very important. Abstraction and polymorphism uh, are the key to make this happen. So we have to rely up upon this very uh, clearly. So what does this really mean in terms of code we normally see? How many times have you come across a piece of code where, I was telling you about this year earlier when I was talking about simplicity. I was working with a client where they had if statements, but 50 of them in the code. Where did that come from? Well, the 50 of them were doing these checks over and over and over, and anytime you had to really change the logic, you have to open that piece of code, change it physically, and then it'll do the job. So it's open for extension, but only through modification. So in other words, let's ask this question. Let's say you have two options. So to add a feature, to add a feature or, or, or enhancement, so let's say to make an enhancement, um, you, can, you have two, uh, two, uh, two, two options on your hand. Uh, one option, change existing code. Two, uh, add a small new module of code. So let's say these are really the two options you have on your hand. Which one of these two would you prefer, option one or option two? Two, clearly you want to change a, a new, um, uh, add a new module of code. Why don't you want to change an existing code? Well, what's the very first thing you do when you open existing code? You curse, right? That's what you do, right? It's like nobody seems to like existing code. 
And, and sometimes we don't even like our own existing code when we look at it. And so, but writing a new model of code is much easier, path of least resistance, and we can write it and, and get, go, get going. Well, so in other words, you want to be able to make a change by not modifying existing code. How can you do that? Well, if, suppose your code is going to go through a, a lot of conditional logic, then it's going to be really hard to make a change to that code over time. Let's look at one example of this just to get an understanding of what this really means to us. So let's say for a minute, we have a class, let's say called, a class called car, and my class car, let's say has a year, well that's great. I'm also gonna put a private, let's say engine, and I'll put an engine here as well. Well, of course we need to know what an engine is, so we can quickly write an engine, so engine, and I don't really have much in the engine, so that's good enough for now. Oh, maybe I could actually do one thing. Let's go ahead and say public, let's say string, or to string, and I'm gonna simply return from here, uh, let's say get class uh, is, uh, is uh, dot get name. So I wanna return a plus, how about that, a little bit more, and I'm gonna say, in this case, hash code, and I'm gonna return those two logic here out of this particular code. Well, that's great, I got a little car, little engine, but of course my car, I need to be able to create a car, so let's go ahead and say over here, uh, public uh, car, and this is gonna take uh, the year as a parameter, and then engine, the engine as a parameter. So everything is so beautiful so far, year equals the year, and of course I can say, uh, in this case, the engine is equal to, let's say the engine, and of course I want one final thing, let's say a string to string, and all I'm gonna do here is return, let's say the year plus, how about returning the uh, engine as well? Well, let's go ahead and try this out. So I'm gonna create a little car equals, car one equals new car, 2015 new engine, and I've created this little object, output car one, and we can see in this case, this little object, we can see a car, a little engine, and a hash code, so everything is good. But what I wanna do is I wanna say car two equals new car, and I'm gonna say car one, and I wanna then output the car two. Well, obviously this doesn't work because Java says you don't have an ability to copy a car to another one. Well, why is that? Because Java does not provide a copy constructor. And why doesn't Java provide a copy constructor? Because C++ gave one, and that didn't work really well at all. And so they said, that hurts and we won't do it. Well, obviously there's still place for copying objects properly, so what am I gonna do? I'm gonna say here public car other, and in this case I'm gonna say year is equal to other uh, dot year, and I'm going to then say engine is equal to other dot engine, but we know that's not gonna work because you don't want to copy the engine, you want a copy of the engine. That's where we went wrong in C++. We want a deep copy and not a shallow copy. So I'm gonna say new engine, and I'm gonna create an object of this engine. But of course, that doesn't work, why not? Because engine doesn't have a copy constructor, so we can quickly fix it. We can say here's the engine's constructor, and here's the engine's copy constructor, which really doesn't do. And this is the beauty of Java, I really like it, right? You can write more code that doesn't do anything. Okay, so then of course, in this case, I can write that code, and when I run that, hey, there you go, we got a nice copy of the object. Well, so that worked, we are happy so far, we made a copy, the engines are different, that's nice. Well, seems like a great idea, what, what, what could be possibly wrong? Well, let's say if three months goes by, and your, you know, your project says, hey, we got some good news, we need another kind of an engine. Now, what kind of engine you want? A turbo engine we want, which is going to extend from engine, absolutely. So for this, we're gonna write a turbo engine constructor. We are also going to, at this point, write a copy constructor for the turbo engine as well. And of course, that's going to call super of the other and pass it down to the base class. This is gonna be super as well. And of course, I don't need to do anything more with this at this point. But here's the question for you. Will I be able to change this to turbo engine? Will the compiler complain at this point? I'll give you a clue, yes or no? <laughs> what do you think? No, the compiler will be happy. And normally, what do you do if the compiler is happy? Ship it, 
right? So we could easily say we're done, right? Well, here comes the problem. If you run the code, notice what happened. The original car has a turbo engine. The second car has only an engine. Oh dear, what went wrong? In fact, this is a bit of a strange thing. In Java, C++, C Sharp, all these languages, new is not polymorphic. It actually comes down to a deficiency in the language. If you look at languages like Ruby, for example, new actually is polymorphic. Whereas in Java, new is not polymorphic. So the entire slew of factories we talk about is just to work around the limitation that new is not polymorphic. That's really sad if you think about it that way. But the point really here is, well, this is not really working. Why? Because we said create me a new engine. No, it's not polymorphic. I need to create a turbo engine and not a new engine. OK, we can create a turbo engine. But there are times when I may have an engine or a turbo engine. We got to fix it. Well, thankfully, this is very easy to fix. All I have to do is if other dot, and then I'm going to say engine is instance of turbo engine. And then all I have to do is engine is equal to new turbo engine. And then a little bit more turbo engine. And then this is going to be other dot engine. And then else, right, I have to do this. Isn't this beautiful, by the way? Right? So when you see this code, it just reminds me how coding is like violence. If it doesn't work, use more of it, right? So we're doing more and more of this. And you can see that turbo engine is working. That's great. Well, OK, so we got a turbo engine. And then we can put the engine back again here and see if that's working. And you can see that's working too. So this is great. It's working. We are done. What do you think? Go for it. Ship it? <laughs> well, you should always have a positive attitude. This is great because this improves job security, right? Because every few months, we can keep, keep coming and changing this code. Well, this is one example of failure of open closed principle. Why is this a failure of open closed principle? Because the only way I can accommodate a new type of engine is by opening this code and changing it. If you think that is worse, there is something even worse than this. When this logic is duplicated in so many places, that's where the real fun is. Because once you add this feature, it'll take you weeks to months to find all the places where we make this decision and then go back and make a change to it. Uh, so what can we do to fix it? Well, the very first thing to think about is um, when we have code, when ask the question, how often this code has to change? But more important, what will influence this code to change? If you look at this constructor, if you put that into words, it becomes very easy to see the problem. So when you look at a piece of code, ask your developers, what will cause this code to change? And the answer is extremely simple here. Let's put it in words. The constructor of car has to change when you create a new type of engine. And if you put it that way, what's the next response? Heck no. Right? Because that's so ridiculous that we have to change a constructor of a car because you are including a new type of an engine. That is broken code. That's exactly what open close principle says. Open close principle says you should be open for extension, meaning you should have other types of engines added, but close for modification. Don't make me change car class just because you're adding a new engine because that's more expensive. And so you can see how what leads to this. Well, the first thing that leads to this is tight coupling. Notice how much more coupling we have in this code. The car is depending on engine, and the car is depending on a turbo engine as well. That is tight coupling. And tight coupling is one thing. Second is cohesion. This has low cohesion. Why? Now it's in the business of creating those other objects, objects as well, and that's not making this code very cohesive. So one thing we can do to solve that particular problem is we can say, take that out. And we can say, in this case, given this engine right here, we can then say, well, other dot engine. And we can then call a function called copy. Well, clearly, I'm not calling the clone method here. And the reason for that is clone itself has some problems in Java. Take a look at effective Java. You'll see why clone is such a bad idea. And rather than going into that deeper, I'll just use a copy method. So how do I solve this particular problem? What I'm going to do here is, first of all, I'm going to go to the engine. 
and make the copy constructor protected. So when I make it protected, you cannot directly call it obviously. So I made it protected. And then I'm going to provide a method here, public, let's say in this case, engine copy. And within this, I'm going to say return new engine. And I'm using the copy constructor on this to create an object itself. So in other words, we are bringing back polymorphism to what was lacking. So just for a minute, what if I were to rewrite this code with this for a minute, dot new? Wouldn't that be really cool? Well, but new is not polymorphic. That's why we are introducing our own little thing to introduce polymorphism here. So in this case, we are saying copy is a polymorphic method. It's going to kick in the copy method and come in here. And of course, if I'm not using the engine but a turbo engine, I will return, in this case, a, a turbo engine rather than returning an engine itself. Now what's going to happen? Well, if I go back to the code now, I'm going to say here is an engine to begin with. I run the code, it's an engine. I introduce a turbo engine now. And when I run the code this time, you can see that's a turbo engine. But just to be sure it's all doing the right things, class, let's say in this case, a piston engine. So here is the new type piston engine, which is going to um, inherit from, let's say in this case, extends from uh, engine itself. And this time around, I'm going to just go ahead and provide these methods right here with these three guys. Of course, obviously, there will be some difference in behavior at this point. So this is the piston engine's constructor, the copy constructor, and the copy function itself. But if I come back here now and say, well, I want to use a piston engine, not an engine. Oh, let's fix this. So in this case, of course, here is the piston engine. So uh, if I go back here to the code and say, hey, this is no longer a turbo engine. I'm going to use a piston engine. You can see we did not have to change the car class. Now, a couple of small details. This code follows the open-closed principle for what? For the copy constructor of the car. If I were to introduce a new type of engine, I don't have to change this piece of code. So that is, is a saving effort in the copy constructor itself. However, there are a few things we have to be very mindful of. The first thing is, I don't know if you noticed this, but quietly though, we were violating the dry principle. Now, every time I added a new piece of class, I had to implement the copy method. If the copy methods are all about the same, why am I really duplicating the copy method? Well, there is one way to remove that duplication and keep the code dry. And one way to do that is we could probably say use reflection here to uh, you know, make a copy. Obviously, you would write the code rather than comment it. And then once you do, you would then remove the copy constructor from the turbo engine, and you can remove the copy constructor from the piston engine as well. And then that code right here could be using the reflection and be done with it. So all you have to do is, at runtime, go get the copy constructor for the class, and then do a new, a new instance on it and create an object of it. So that's one thing you can do. Well, that's one consequence. The second consequence here is, while this code is open, closed, principle compliant, we got to be careful what it really means to be open, closed, compliant. In other words, what are we really trying to do? We are trying to make the code extensible. Uh, that's what we are trying to do. But extensibility is a magic for most of the part. Now, what is this code extensible for? This code is extensible for adding another type of engine which complies with the engine's interface. Well, OK, that's cool. What if I wanted not one engine, but I want my car to have two engines? Sorry, tough luck. I cannot provide that without changing the car class. So in other words, a class is not infinitely extensible. It's only extensible for what you design for. If somebody tells you they design software and it always is extensible, there are only two possibilities then. You are working with somebody with a very divine power, right? Or they are lying. And what are the chances, right? So the point really is you cannot make things infinitely extensible. But extensibility is also a big problem. Because if I start making code absolutely extensible, what do you think is going to happen? it is going to increase complexity. So you get more complexity with more extensibility. Well, how do I deal with it? 
Well, there is something to keep in mind about extensibility. So who can make code, make code extensible? Um, so this is going to require a few more thought, and that is we need to know software and domain, right? So if you want to make something extensible, you got to know the software. If you don't know about software problems, if you don't know about software, you know, cost of changing software, how could you arbitrarily make things extensible? So that's one thing. But you also need to know one more thing. You better know the domain. If you don't know what the domain is, what are you going to do? You're not going to think of things you need to make extensible. And then when time comes, you're going to be hit on the face, so you need both of those. But that poses a challenge. And the challenge is this. There are three kinds of people uh, we work with. This is different from the two kinds I mentioned in the first part, right? So there are three kinds of people that we work with. The first kind uh, knows domain really well, knows no software. Um, you know people like this at work, right? They are your domain experts. They can start talking about domain all day long. You can go to them and ask questions about the domain, and they will explain every bit of physics, chemistry, math, biology, whatever that is, or trading, or e-commerce, or how the world works. Everything they can explain to you. But they don't have a clue about software. In fact, it's a bit more dangerous. They don't have a clue about software, but they think they're experts because they wrote Fortran code in college, right? So there are people like that who are really good in domain, but nothing to do with software. Then comes the second group, uh, knows no domain at all, knows software really well. Well, these are software developers. A lot of us fall into this category. I can probably say I, I know nothing about domain. I tend to do software generally. So we could say we could fit into this domain as well. Hey, I can understand software complexities. I can understand software problems. But I can't think of what's really relevant for the domain to extend. There is this third group of people knows domain really well and knows software really well. This group is far and few in an organization. These are people that you know, and we will politely ignore that fourth category. Now, given this, there are this, this small group which really knows about software and really knows about domain. It is this little group that can really make the decision nicely well because they understand the domain complexities and domain needs and software complexities and software needs and say, oh, in the future, if we were to handle this, that would become a problem in software, let's design for it. But unfortunately though, most of the people that we work with are these two types, which means we have to constantly collaborate with our business. You as a software developer have to ask, Hey, what kind of stuff I need to look out for extensibility? The domain experts have to be really you know, encouraged to talk about extensibilities in the domain that may be relevant. And then we bring that in and say, oh, is this something that could change? What's the probability of this changing? What are the consequences of this changing? And then we have to design for it and model it. And that takes a lot of effort and time for us to do. But without that kind of collaboration, we will not be able to accommodate the, uh, the uh, you know, extensibility in software. So don't assume that all software that can be extended is extensible or should be extensible because that could be really more expensive to be able to extend software that way as well. So we got to be very careful about it. So having said that, we talked about the open close principle and it says a software module must be open for extension but closed for modification. So this says that when you're creating software, you need to ask yourselves, what kind of change should I really plan for? So my recommendation is this. When you are developing software, don't try to go overboard and make it extensible. First ask, when you get an extensibility question, go find a domain expert, a reasonable, respectable domain expert, and say, I'm thinking of these things, should I plan for extensibility in this area? Because there's a cost of doing it, I would rather not do it if it's not needed, what are the probabilities of this? And if you don't know, then don't really plan for it right now. And when the time comes, and you need something very similar to it, at that time refactor the code 
and introduce extensibility at that time on the second instance rather than going that way where it makes really hard to extend over time. So, so give it time, apply the Yagni principle before you use the open close principle in that, in that time instance. So that is something to think about. So we talked about the open closed principle. The next principle I want to talk about is called the Liskov substitution principle. Liskov substitution principle really hits the nerve on something we've been doing fairly poorly in our programming practices. And that is an overuse of inheritance. So inheritance is uh, something we have overly used, overused. And inheritance has been overused in almost every project you can think of. There are times when we shouldn't be using inheritance, but we have been using inheritance quite a bit. Now we'll talk about why that is a little later, but what does this really say? What Liskov suppression principle says, Barbara Liskov wrote this, and she says, inheritance should be used, so inheritance should be used only for substitutability. Now, what does that really mean, substitutability? Well, so what this means is, inheritance should be used only when your intention is to substitute an object of a class where another object is needed. So let's put it this way. Um, if an object of A, uh, of B, should be used, so it should be used anywhere an object of, object of A is used, uh, then use inheritance. Um, so that's first number rule. On the other hand, if an object of B should use an object of A, then use composition uh, or delegation, depending on what word you like to use. Uh, so this means if you are trying to use an object of B anywhere an object of A can be used, then go ahead and use inheritance. You really want substitutability. However, if your goal is to use an object of B, and you want to use the object of A within the object of B, just use it. Don't use inheritance. Just use delegation or containment or composition. So, but why should I really care? Why shouldn't I really use inheritance uh, just because I like to use inheritance? Well, the reason is uh, inheritance, inheritance poses, uh, requires, so let's say inheritance demands more uh, from a developer uh, than a composition or delegation does. So in other words, if you want to use something, you can just use it. But if you want to use inheritance, you have to follow a very rigorous contract. And what is that contract? And the contract is that services of the derived class uh, should require no more and promise no less than the corresponding um, uh, services, services of the base class. So this is a very big demand on you. So it says the services of the derived class should require no more and promise no less than the corresponding services of the base class. So if I want to inherit from your class, I must not say, I want more stuff than what the base is requiring. I cannot say, I will give you less than what the base is requiring, right? I, I cannot do that. So let's say for a minute, uh, let's say the, um, you know, you know, we often say, you know, we can bring in substitute people, right? So let's say I'm a substitute teacher. And I come in, and I want to substitute for a teacher. Well, the students will be really angry. Well, students are normally angry, but they'll be really angry if I say my requirements are way too strict than your teacher. They're going to say, out of here. Our teacher is such a nice person, you're too strict. So I cannot be more restrictive and require more than their teacher. And similarly, I can promise less either. I got to promise whatever the other teacher was going to substitute, substitute uh, the original was going to sub, uh, provide, I should provide that too. I can be more flexible, I can be nice, but I cannot be more you know, rigorous on it. So the point really is, you cannot require more and you cannot promise less. But then that leads to the question, always the wonderful question to ask, why? Why shouldn't it really be the case? And the reason actually is pretty simple. The reason is the user of a base class should be able to use an instance of a derived class uh, without 
knowing the difference. So this is the real goal we are after. And the real goal is a user of a base class must be able to use an object of the derived class without ever knowing the difference. In other words, if I am receiving an object and I'm using the object, tomorrow you give me another object and I'm going to say, hey, wait, this object, I can't use it. Well, that's not a good use of uh, inheritance because as a user, I'll come to know this is a problem. So what this rule says is a user of a base class should never be able to know the difference between a base object and a derived object being sent to them. And, and this is something you and I have to make sure we protect at the code level. If we don't, the design begins to fall apart and we don't know why it's falling apart and we put more patchy code around it and it actually ends up not only failing Liskov substitution principle, it often ends up failing the, uh, the open closed principle as well. Because remember what you could do. In your code, you could say, if the object is base, do this. If the object is derived, do something else. And you got an if-else statement already, trying to check for what type of object it is. And what's that? That's a failure of open close principle. Well, why did you fail open close principle? Because this class coming in is really not behaving properly. It's violating Liskov substitution principle. So violating Liskov substitution principle may result in violating open close principle on the user code. So you're punishing the user of your code by violating Liskov substitution principle as well. So you're inviting them to really violate another principle that could happen as well. Well, so this is a very simple principle and yet so powerful. And it simply tells us we are using inheritance way more than we should really do. I remember one day, I got an email from a colleague of mine, and, and he said, I wrote this code, and I'm not able to really make this work anymore. Could you please take a look at this and see what I'm doing wrong? So I take his code, and I'm struggling with it for about 10, 15 minutes, trying to understand why it doesn't work. And I couldn't figure out what's going on. Why wouldn't this work? And eventually, I said, wait a second. And I go in to take a look at what he's actually doing. He created a class that if my memory serves me right now, was inheriting from a J of a, a panel. And it turns out the class was written with no intention that anybody should be inheriting from it. And in this case, of course, with all the enormous inheritance logic to get around that restriction, the code has become overly complex. After about 25, 30 minutes of work, my email back to him was, you shouldn't use inheritance. Right? You should really use composition and not inheritance. And I refactor the code to show how you can do it and say, that's a much better way, a lot less code also, and easier to work. So don't try to bring inheritance where it doesn't really belong in, in place. So that is something to keep in mind. Well, so what can we do about this? Well, you can see evidence of Liskov substitution principle in so many places. I'm going to give you good evidences and bad evidences as well. I'm going to show you both. So here is a good evidence I'm going to show you. Well, the first good evidence is public versus protected in base, let's say, versus derived. So in, in base versus derived and, 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 uh, and, and base class versus derived classes, let's look at this quickly. So I have a class here called engine, as you can see. And in this case, I have a two-string method sitting here in the engine. And you can see the code is just happy right now with uh, no problems. Of course, I removed the copy uh, function. So uh, that's why it was complaining. So let me put that back. OK, so in this case, of course, you can see that when I run through the code, the code is behaving as it should behave and produces the result it should produce. Great. Now I'm going to go back to the turbo engine. And I'm going to take this two-string method and I'm going to put it right here, not a problem. But I'm going to change this to uh, protected. Now, notice what I've done here. I took the function which is public in the base class, and I made it protected in the derived class. Well, Java says, no, don't do that. Well, why does Java give a compilation error? The Java gives a compilation error because you, are, you have restricted the derived much more than the base is restricted. So you are saying, if as a user of the base, you can use two string, but as a user of a derived, you shouldn't use two string. You are violating the contract. You're requiring more or promising less. That's a violation. And Java says, sorry, I won't let you do this. Please don't. 
So in the case of Java, you cannot do this. What about C sharp? Well, in the case of C sharp, you are required to keep it exactly the same. Well, in the, in the case of Java, you can be more generous. For example, in the case of Java, you could have a function in the base class called protected, let's say void foo, and notice in the derived class, I'm going to put a protected void foo, not a problem, but I can also make this public void foo, that's not a problem. You can be more generous, but you cannot be more restrictive. In the case of C-sharp, they require you to be exactly the same. They don't want you to violate it. So if it's public, it's public, protected, protected, private, private, you cannot change it. Uh, you may ask, what about C++? You never talk about C++ and logic, so never mind. So the point really is that you can do anything you want in C++. All right, so this is really implemented at the language level. Now you know why we are implementing the language level. Well, that's a good part in here. Another example, a derived function can't, uh, can't uh, throw any new uh, uh, checked exception, so checked exception, uh, exception uh, not thrown by the base uh, unless the new exception uh, extends the old one, right, uh, uh, being thrown by the uh, base class, right? So what is the point here? Well, suppose I have a function here, let's say public void foo, and in this case, I'm going to say throw. Well, there's no throws here, absolutely. So that's my foo function. I'm going to come to the derived class, and I'm going to say public void foo throws IO exception. And I'm going to throw an IO exception from the derived class in this case. So let's go ahead and bring that in. So what's going to happen now? Well, notice this guy wants to throw an exception. The base is not throwing. And so what does it say? Well, it says uh, throws. And it says, oh, wait, you cannot throw a new exception. Cannot override foo in engine. Overriding method does not throw an IO exception. So you're not allowed to throw a new exception that's not being thrown by the base class. Why? Because you're violating the contract from the case of inheritance, isn't it? Imagine this for a minute. I'm a user of the base class and I'm waiting with a bunch of exceptions to handle, and your class throws a completely different exception, and I'm like, hey, wait, I'm calling, wait a minute, it blew up over there, not here, what just went on, and that's gonna surprise you as a user. And that really is problematic. What, what would you then do? You would start catching exceptions that are not being thrown, the compiler won't let you do it, then you start doing instance of type check, if it's a derived handle these exceptions, if the base handle that exception, violating open close principle. So you cannot do that. Well, here is another one that is also pretty nice and, and subtle, but really nice as well. And I actually have to say I like this. So let me show you an example of one other thing you can actually do. Let's say for a minute I have a class over here. And let's say our class is called class book. And I have a class called book. I'm going to create over here a list, let's say, of book. And I'll say books over here. So here is the books. And equal to new, let's say, array list. And I'm going to say, here's my book. Well, you can see in this case, we can have a collection of books. E easily, we can create it. But now comes the question, hey, what's, what if I have another class, let's say? Well, let's actually say, in this case, I have a function, which is, say, public over here, a static void process. And this is going to take a list of book. We'll call it books. And it doesn't matter what this function is actually doing. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say process. And I'm going to send books to it over here. So I can take a collection of books and pass it over here. And of course, that code shouldn't have any problem with it. So that should be uh, really OK. Well, what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to create a class, let's say here, class. And I'm going to say these are called tech books. So I have tech book is going to extend from books. And so I have a tech book class on my hand. Now what do I want to do? Well, I want to say a list over here of a tech book. And this is going to be, uh, uh, you know, let's call it as tech books equal to new array list. And I'm going to create a list of tech books. Now I'm going to say process and send textbooks to this particular function right here. And of course, I'm going to print 
OK2 here. Well, what's going to happen? Well, notice it gives me an error. In compatible type, you cannot pass textbook where list of books is ac accepted. Hey, wait a minute. This is a list of textbook. After all, textbook inherits from book. Why can't I pass that to the collection? Well, the reason actually is fairly simple. There are workarounds, but that's a default behavior. And what is it saying? It says uh, you cannot add. So here's the reason why this is not allowed. If you want to think about why this is not allowed. I can say books.add, and I can add a book to it. Well, if you pass a tech book, now I will be able to add a normal book to a collection which can only have tech book. And that's going to be a problem. And so to avoid this, this would potentially fail because you can't have tech books, sorry, regular books in a collection of tech books. Or it could be a, one of the derived objects as well from the book. And they don't want you to do, do any of these. And that's why they don't l uh, allow it. So the next one here is collection of derived. So collection of derived does not extend from collection of base. Right? That's the rule that a lot of different languages impose. Scala does this. Java does this. So a lot of languages impose this kind of requirement. Because why? Liskov sufficient principle says you're going to violate the behavior if you do it. So even though we have seen these in languages, putting a name to it actually makes it easier for us to see why we are doing these things. Well, I gave you some really good examples where this is being done. Unfortunately, not everything is good. There are a few bad examples also we can actually take a look at. One such bad example, unfortunately, is the stack class. So let's take a look at a stack for a minute. So I have a stack over here. Let's just start with the stack. And let's just quickly take a look at the stack itself. Sadly, notice, what does a stack do? A stack extends from a vector. Now think about this for a minute. What's the job of a vector? A job of a vector is to allow inserts and remove into an element. Well, what is the job of a stack? A stack preserves invariant. So a stack says, I will let you add on the top, and I will let you remove on the top. You should not be able to go into a stack and arbitrarily remove and add elements into a stack. So there's a concept of invariant we have to be careful about. So what does invariant say? Invariance on a stack says, you can only remove what you put in last, LIFO, last in, first out. Great. But unfortunately, no, though, notice how a stack extends from a vector. What is the consequence of that? Imagine for a minute that he has a function that accepts a vector. And what does this function do? It says, here's my vector. I'm going to use my vector. Well, he has a function that accepts a vector. And he takes the vector and passes it down to him. That's all he does. So they've been happy, and they're using this function. I come along. I create a stack. And I say, here's my stack. Here you go, and I pass it to him. What does he do? He says, nice vector. And then he takes the vector and passes it down the chain to the next function. And what does he do? He says, ah, vector, come on over. And he inserts and removes elements from it. And then I get back the stack and say, how's it going? And the stack is limping over and says, please never do this again to me, right? And the stack says, I feel overly violated, right? So the stack is un unbelievably unhappy. Why? Because you completely violated its invariant. And it says, never send, it, send me back to him, right? And the minute it sees him, it runs away. So the point really is, this is not his problem. He's a nice guy. It looks like a nice guy. He's, he says he's a nice guy. OK, then he is. So he says, what did I do? All I did was I use a vector like I do it every day. Well, Liskov substitution principle says a user of a base class should be able to use a derived object without knowing a difference. It could be even worse than that. My stack could have thrown a runtime exception on him. Poor guy, what would he say? He would say, life was so good until today, and suddenly my code begins to fail with the runtime exception. What's up with that? Well, that's because we have a new class in the block, and that's misbehaving, right? So in other words, this inheritance is really problematic. And we should avoid these kinds of inheritance. Why? Because it's not intended to provide that kind of capability. So in other words, it's much better to say a stack uses a vector in internally rather than to be used as a vector. So that's an example of how we could potentially violate Liskov substitution principle. Now, here comes the problem. We all can agree to this. We can say use composition 
or delegation instead of inheritance unless, and then we can have a few reasons, unless you want substitutability. So that's great. We can all agree to it. We have read about this in good design books. And what do you normally do? You read this and say, absolutely, I would rather use uh, 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 delegation than using inheritance. And you put the book away, you turn to Java code, and what do you use? Inheritance. Why? Because inheritance is so easy to use, right? So imagine for a minute that you are trying to write a piece of code, and the requirement tells you you need to bring in a class with very similar functions that are in another class. So let's look at an example of that. So I'm going to go back here to this code right here. And I'm, here's the uh, you know, requirement given to us, let's say. So you have a class called A. And what does this class A have? It contains a function called, let's say, f1. And it contains a function called f2. It doesn't matter what these functions do right now. And now the problem says the following. The problem says, given this class, oops. So the problem says, given this particular class, here's what I want to do. So it says class B, and it says uh, should have. So this says should have F1, F2, uh, and a note says same as in A, and then and F3. Well, that's very easy. Let's write that function F3 first of all. So F3 in the class, we can write it. Great, I have function f3, but what about f1 and f2? Well, I want to implement function f1 and f2, but I don't want to spend too much time implementing it. So here is a very easy way for me to implement that function. All I would have to do very quietly is to simply go here and say extends a. So that was so easy to do, wasn't it? So now, you got F1 and F2 for free, right? And who doesn't want free stuff anyways? So that was very easy. But what did we buy into it now? What we bought in right now, whether we wanted it or not, is anywhere an object of A can be used, an object of B can be used as well, without the user of A knowing the difference. And that's a lot of burden we committed to without really committing to it. And that becomes a burden for us to maintain. So what's a better answer? The better answer is don't use inheritance and instead come down here and say private a object equals new a. So create an object of that. Then write a public void f1. And then you say object.f1 call it. And then you say public void f2. And then you say, in this case, of course, this is an integer. So int f2. And then what should I do? In this case, I'll say return and return object.f1 and write that code to return that function f2. So you could write this code all by yourself. So that is another solution you could, you could use. Well, the problem in this case is you had to sit there and type all of this. Well, OK, you could do that. Or this problem is so common that they figured out people are going to do this quite often. So what you do is you say extends A, but don't tell anybody you did this, and then quietly right click on it, click on refactor, and then select replace inheritance with delegation. So you can just use the refactoring facility and select the methods, and before you could blink your eyes, they do it for you. Now you say, this is awesome, but what if I don't have an ID like this? If you don't have an ID like this, find somebody who can type really fast, right? So the point is, you don't want to use inheritance still. But whether you use an IDE or whether you type it manually, we are not using inheritance. However, there is a bit of a problem on our hand right now. Good news, so if we, so let's talk about this for a minute. If we use inheritance, inheritance in this case, and so if you use inheritance, um, you know, in this case, uh, what, what happens? We violate LSP. So we are not using inheritance. But are we done or do we have problems? What do you think? What do you think? 
uh, first is dry. And you're right, tight coupling. Let's put, say that a little differently. It's an OCP violation, right? Remember I was talking about coupling and OCP, open close principle. So it violates two principles here. What principle are you violating? Well, the dry principle, first of all. How, how am I violating dry? I duplicated the effort in this case. For every method there, I had to type the method here. Well, if I use an IDE, I didn't quite duplicate the code manually. You can say, he did it, not me, right? But still we violated that. So we're duplicating it. And the minute you dupl duplicate it, the code becomes your vomit to maintain after that, right? So that is something that's going to be there. The second problem is open closed principle. How so? If I change the name of this function, oops, if I change that F1 to F1A, our code is broken. I got to come and babysit this F1A, right? So that's one burden. We have to, this code is never closed from modification to the code A. That's one burden you're going to carry through in this case. In fact, this is going to even ripple through. That probably is going to be 1A as well. So we are violating two principles. So the question is, then you have to really ask the question. You have a choice here. Should I violate, so should I uh, violate Liskov substitution principle or should I violate dry and OCP? So sometimes life has these uh, challenges in front of us. You have to really violate one or the other. And so what is your choice? What do you think? Which one should I violate? The second one. Okay, so I would rather violate the dry principle and open close principle here than violating Liskov substitution principle. Why? And the reason is I never want to go continue with this. Remember, if I violate LSP, the user of the class probably is going to violate open close principle. I would rather violate it than violate myself and force you to violate as well. So the, the crime, the sin is in me. I don't want to be you being part of the sin as a user of my class. But wouldn't it be nice if you don't have to violate this at all? Wouldn't that be beautiful to live in the world where we don't have to violate any of the principles? Well, let's see how we can do that. So I'm going to come back here to this code. Well, I'm going to write this code in Groovy. So let's see what Groovy does for us. Class worker, I'm going to say worker, and I'm going to define a function here called work. And what does the function work do? Well, it's going to work. So print line, let's say working. Just to be sure this is actually working. Let's define here Joe equals new worker. And we'll say Joe.work to make sure that it's actually working. And here's a Groovy code. He's happy. Great. Now I'm going to create a class. The class I'm going to create is called a manager class. And as you would expect, the manager does absolutely nothing. So now I'm going to say Bob equals new manager. And I'm going to say Bob.work. This is an alien concept for the manager, right? You are telling the manager to do something very unusual. But this manager is actually very smart. And the manager says, I got a better way to handle this. So the manager says, delegate worker victim equals new uh, worker. So now you can see how when you call the work method on the manager, the manager is actually able to do the work. So the point really is, this does not violate Liskov substitution principle. It does not violate the, depend, uh, the uh, dry principle. This does not violate the open closed principle either. How so? If I come and change the object of worker, I don't have to touch the manager. Because when the compiler recompiles the code, this is a compile time meta programming. So using compile time meta programming, it when you recompile the code, it automatically synthesizes the appropriate methods. In other words, if you look at the bytecode, what you will notice is in the manager class, you got almost the same code that the IDE was creating a few minutes ago on the Java site. The only difference is when the IDE creates that code, it becomes part of your source code that you have to maintain. That's where the violation of dry and OCP came in. Whereas what Groovy does is it generates that code 
in the bytecode level, so you never have to maintain that bytecode by hand. And anytime you modify the source code, you recompile this code, it resynthesizes the methods for you. So that's one of the biggest benefits you get. By using these kinds of techniques, we can remove this kind of violation of the principles, and, and languages can mature enough to provide some of these principles. We already saw how Java is mature enough to support LSP in so many areas. We saw that already. For example, in case of exceptions, in case of private versus protected. And we also saw how it protects us from inheritance when we are dealing with collections of objects and extension. So Java does this quite a bit, but Java can also go a little further and say, hey, I'm going to take care of this for method injection as well. They could potentially do this if that, you know, eventually that can be a feature added either to a language or through libraries. We can, we can you know, expect something like that. So we talked about the Liskov substitution principle. And what does the Liskov substitution principle say? It says that use inheritance only one time, and that is when you want substitutability. Use inheritance only when you can guarantee that the user of a base class can use an object of your derived class without ever knowing the difference. That's basically what it really boils down to. And if they ever have to know the difference, then don't use inheritance. Well, the next principle I want to talk about here is called the dependency inversion principle. And I want to say a few things about this principle before going into the detail. This is probably one of the principles we all have used the most, maybe without even realizing it. Anytime you have done test-driven development, anytime you have said, I want to talk to a real object versus I want to talk to a mock object, you have used dependency inversion principle automatically. Dependency inversion principle says that, simply put, it says, and you have to be very careful using this, it says a class should not, so should not, depend on another class, another class, they both, so they both uh, have to uh, depend on uh, an abstraction, or we can say interface. So it essentially says a class must not depend on another class. And again, I want to emphasize, use caution. If you blindly use this, you're going to uh, increase complexity of your code. So I wouldn't recommend using any principle unless you see a really good reason or a force to use the principle. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to talk about design patterns. And when, I when it comes to design patterns, I often relate to these design principles quite a bit. And, and so I rely on these principles a lot. But I only use the principles when it actually makes sense, when it makes difference. So don't use these principles when it doesn't really have a compelling reason to use. But having said that, the dependency inversion principle says, uh, depend on a class. A class should not depend on a class. Instead, both of those should depend on an interface. Well, you, if you've used a mock object, and you want to substitute a mock object with a real object during testing versus integration, what do you normally do? You have an interface that is going to support in between. Or you have several services you want to talk to. One of the poorest way you can use this code is, you could have said, I've got all these services. I'm going to switch between these services using an if-else statement and you know, instance of. We know that's violating open close principle. Well, this is what I've noticed most of the time. I don't want to violate open close principle. How do I avoid it? I tend to use dependency inversion principle to avoid it. So I see these two principles kind of working in tandem. To avoid open close principle violation, I often employ dependency inversion principle. So I usually see open close principle as what I'm trying to get away from. And I often see that dependency inversion principle is what I often get into. So that seems to be a nice tandem of these principles. Not all the time, but they seem to happen a lot of times together. Now, I want to give you an example of open close principle, but I'm going to do that without actually writing a single line of code. And I'm sure we can relate to this very quickly. And for this, I'm going to talk about my very first visit to Norway. And I go there very frequently uh, to teach classes and do some consulting. But this was my very first trip back about 17 years ago. Well, remember what was 17 years ago? There was the time when we did not have smartphones. Uh, it's hard to re remember this, right? It was a time with no cell phones, actually. So I land in Norway, and uh, this was an afternoon. I was there to teach a Java course, actually, for a week. And I landed on a Sunday afternoon, and I look around the hotel room, and they did not have a coffee maker. 
And I'm a guy who has to drink really bad coffee several times a day. So I kind of looked around the room. There was no coffee maker. I went down to the reception and said, excuse me, there's no coffee maker. And, and they said, yeah, we don't give coffee makers. And I went into a lengthy discussion of about why coffee is so important for me. And finally, the lady said, you know what? You can take my coffee maker. Keep it with you. I'll take it from your room at the end of the week. She was ready to get rid of me. So now I had a coffee maker. I was really happy. Well, I was getting ready for bed. I'm a guy who usually goes to bed reasonable time. I'm not a real late nighter. I get up fairly early in the mornings. I'm an early morning person. So I decided to go to bed. And I also rarely have jet lags because I travel a lot. I don't have jet lags. So I was ready to go to bed. And as I was getting ready to go to bed, I looked around the room and I was shocked a little bit because I did not see a clock in the room. And I was really agitated. I thought to myself, what does this Norwegian uh, you know, hotels have to do with anything that starts with a C? No coffee maker, now no clock. So I went to the reception and I said, I have uh, some trouble. And the lady there, rolling her eyes, said, here's the again, and said, what's your problem now? I said, my room doesn't have a clock. And she said, yep, we don't give clocks in the rooms. I said, that's a problem. Uh, because without a clock, how do I wake up in the morning? She looked very confused and she said, why would you need a clock to wake up in the morning? I said, you see, because by my bedside, I have this clock and early in the morning, it makes such a horrible noise, I cannot sleep for the rest of the day. I want that kind of a clock. And then she looked very confused and said, I don't understand why you would need a clock to wake up. I said, I just explained to you, this clock makes a noise I cannot sleep for the rest of the day. And then she looked at me and said, you, what you need is not a clock. What you need is an alarm. I looked at her and said, lady, don't get technical on me, right? <laughs> and but, you know, she said, but, but you don't need a clock. You need an alarm. And I was not happy at this point. I said, well, OK. Let's say I have to wake up in the morning. I need an alarm. And I looked in the room. I did not find a clock. She said, you don't need a clock. I'm like, OK, fine. I need an alarm. And she said, well, there is an alarm in your room. I said, really? I didn't see a clock. She said, no, there's an alarm in your room. Well, where is the alarm? Well, did you turn on the TV? I said, I don't watch TV. She said, this week you will. She's like, OK. <laughs> so I go back to the room, and I turn on the TV. And this was amazing technology. You know, I didn't know this. I turn on the TV. It says, welcome to this hotel, Venkat. This is your alarm, too. She was right, actually. But I'm a huge fan of TDD. You think I'm going to trust them? No. So I set the alarm for two minutes from then, turn it off, and I'm waiting. And two minutes later, what a great you know, invention. It turns on. And I was like, this is awesome. But make sure, three minutes later. And I said it again, wait for three minutes. And three minutes later, it turns on. And I noticed something a little weird. It didn't matter. I mean, when you're doing testing, you might as well do thorough testing, right? So I changed channel. Set the alarm and turned it off. Don't ask me why, but you, know, you do weird things when you're in jet lag. OK, so, and then what happened? Well, this is coming back with CNN. And I thought this was kind of interesting. But anyway, I said, yeah, funny. And I turn off the TV, set the alarm for early in the morning. I go to bed. Now, you only have to imagine this scene because it's really, really, what do you call it, a torturous, a, a tormenting. So here I am in a dark room. It's winter time, so it's dark everywhere. So it's a dark room, and suddenly I hear a voice. And I wake up, I'm like, oh my gosh, where am I? I don't remember where I am now. And I'm in this room, and I hear a voice. I don't think I've ever gone from 180 to 90 so fast. <laughs> and I'm like, and I look up, and I'm in a state of panic, because right in front of me, the TV is on for reasons I don't know, and there's a guy in suspender saying, Hello, this is Larry King Live. Have you ever imagined waking up to Larry King Live? I had to go into counseling after I went to that week. And now I'm awake, and the volume keeps increasing by the second. I'm like, where's the remote? Turn off, turn off, turn off. I don't want to wake up the neighbors, right? And my heart is pounding. I'm like, OK, the TV is off now. The volume is low. And why am I awake now? Where am I? And I started thinking, I've got to tie this back into this anyways, right? So I was thinking, and I thought about this lady, and she taught me a wonderful lesson. She said, Hey, person Venkat, you should not depend on clock. You should depend on alarm. This was a very nice idea because it made me realize a few things I did not think about. Because when I depend on a clock, I am so dependent on the clock. 
But what did the clock provide? Sure, the clock provided the alarm, but my dependency was totally messed up. What I was depending on was not the clock. What I was really depending on was that horrible alarm that the clock has. Now that she mentioned this, I realized quickly that I can do quite a few interesting things with it. So what I can do, this is a probably ever you have seen UML being drawn in a notepad, but the point really is, you can do some wonderful things with this. She taught me very quickly, what I really need is a TV. And you think I'm gonna be watching Larry King wake me up every day? No, I quickly the next day wrote a little program on my computer and that became my alarm pretty quickly for the rest of the week. Well, these days, of course, I don't need a computer. I got smartphones uh, on my hand, which I can use. And that works really well as well. So we could use so many different implementations, all the way down to even some really advanced implementations. And I do have to tell you, this is one of my most favorite alarms I ever find. Because I travel a lot, and I have this really a uh, problem where I have to go to airports very early, which I always do mostly, and I have always this fear, what if I sleep through by mistake? It's not happened so far, but what if it does? And so I make use of one more alarm, in my opinion, the best alarm in the world. It's called my wife. And this is amazing because no other alarm pleases me as much as my wife when she calls me. Anyway, so you can have wide variety of implementations of alarm as you can see. And the point is, you can have these kinds of alarm and you can switch and swap between those alarms without ever having to change this particular class. That's exactly what the dependency inversion principle says. So the dependency inversion principle says, a concrete class like person should not depend on, this is a person, should not depend on a concrete class like a clock. Instead, let's put in a clock here too, instead both the classes, clock and the person, should depend on an alarm. So it essentially says you want to invert the direction of dependency, and the inversion doesn't make, make a good sense unless we think of this inversion as, rather than going from concrete to concrete, you're inverting to go from concrete to interface. That's basically what dependency inversion principle says. So we use this principle very extensively, like I said, anytime we are trying to decouple. So dependency inversion principle is a principle that lowers coupling in our code. And by lowering coupling, it becomes a code easier to extend. But we have to be very careful when to use it and where to use it. We definitely don't want to use it without really thinking through the consequences because there is a cost of using interfaces as well. And we got to make sure that we are using it for the right reasons. And so we can start using this. Now, I also want to quickly mention, I have kind of slightly deviated from this principle, not from the point of view of interfaces uh, or, the, or the classes, but from, from the point of view of making it a little bit more lightweight by using lambda expressions. So let me explain what I mean by that. What I mean by that is, if you're using the strategy pattern, yeah, I wanted to mention this. I mentioned that I often relate principles when I talk about design patterns. Talk about strategy pattern for a minute. What design principle are you using in the strategy pattern? Well, it's the dependency inversion principle. Because if you think about it, what does the strategy pattern say? You are depending on a piece of code, but you want to vary the strategy of implementation within that code. So you normally extract the strategy as an interface, provide alternate implementations, and you switch them. So clearly, when you look at the strategy pattern, it's a dependency inversion principle that you are using. So whenever I look at design patterns, I often, often relate back to design principles. But having said that, with the strategy pattern, I've started changing things quite a bit in Java 8. Rather than using interfaces and a class hierarchy, I tend to use lambda expressions. So in other words, rather than alarm being an interface which has several implementation, I make alarm as a, as a functional interface, let's say. So functional, uh, let's say functional interface. And if I make it as a functional interface, then what happens? Well, then I'm not going to have these classes. I can have a library of lambda expressions, so lambda expressions uh, that conform to the alarm functional interface. So in other words, I am beginning to more and more use lambda expressions as implementors of my interfaces 
rather than using uh, anonymous inner classes or regular classes. So my design patterns have become a little lightweight compared to what I used to do before uh, Java 8. And, uh, and, and, and I'm going to talk about this in my talk tomorrow separately. But the idea is I often use these principles very heavily in the, in the use of design patterns, but, but also start beginning to change quite a bit along the way how these are being realized. The next thing I want to talk about really quickly, but only a little bit here, is the so-called interface segregation principle. The interface segregation principle really is cohesion, single responsibility principle, but at the interface level. So this says, when you design an interface that a class is going to implement, do not make the interfaces fat. You instead make the interfaces really cohesive, narrow, focused, and focused on one thing and one thing well. So in other words, let's say for a minute you are creating an abstraction. Let's say we have a clock for a minute. Well, what does my clock do? Well, set time, of course. I can say get time to get the time. Set alarm, get al you know, alarm time, for example. I could do that too. But I can then start going through more things on a clock that I can start looking for. Like, for example, you know, set radio station and listen to radio. I actually have a clock which does all of that. And so in this case, what does my clock do? My clock does a clock. My clock does an alarm. My clock does a radio. And I can use it for any of these purposes. Unfortunately, though, if you look at this, what does this clock really do? And if I extract an interface from the clock, that's a very bulky, comp complex interface. Instead, what I should do is I should say class clock implements, and I'm going to say timepiece, comma, alarm, comma, radio. And I can say in this case that my clock is going to have one of these or all of these things. But what is the beauty of this? The beauty of this is a user of the class, let's say user one, only cares for a timepiece and I can use a clock, so send a clock, but they are not concerned about, um, right, they're not concerned about the other details of this particular abstraction. So you are not passing to the user one a complex set of things. And this user says, I only care about the timepiece. I don't care about everything else this particular clock can do. Similarly, what I can do here is I can start with the user two, and I can say this guy wants an alarm. Well, I can send a clock to this as well. However, this user doesn't have to know anything about the other pieces like timepiece or radio. I could also have a user three who wants a radio, and I can send a clock to this as well. Well, guess what? This user doesn't have to be burdened by an alarm detail. Hey, I don't care about it. Just give me this, and I'm done with it. So of course, you can have a user 4 who wants a, a timepiece and an alarm. And you can do what? You can also send, send a clock to it also. This clock you can send. Maybe you cannot send other clocks. Well, user 1, user 2, user 3 can get any particular device which can support a timepiece or an alarm or a radio. User 4, of course, is restricted to a timepiece uh, and alarm implementer, so it's a bit more restrictive. But the beauty is you are able to divide this class's interface into multiple cohesive interfaces, where each of the interface is focused narrow and focused on one little behavior that you are interested in exposing. So I consider interface segregation principle as a principle that you can use uh, to make your interface cohesive, narrow, focused, and uh, do one thing and one thing well. So we talked about quite a number of principles here. These principles have been around for quite a long time, but you probably have heard of the solid principles uh, until now. But I want to spend a minute on talking about solid. Well, solid is single responsibility principle, open closed principle, Liskov sufficient principle, interface segregation principle, and dependency inversion principle. But I think there is more to this we need to really keep in mind. We talked also about the Yagni principle, and then we also talked about the dry principle. So don't forget the dry and Yagni. Those are extremely important as well, because I find that not only do we need to think about solid principles, something is more fundamental than solid, 
which is not duplicating code, duplicating effort, and also postponing things so that we don't get dragged into complexity. And, and our, our desire to keep complexities minimum is something we have to honor and respect as well. So that is something we should definitely do. So given this, we can think of these principles and we can apply them. But the question is, when do we really use these principles? And also, how do we really apply these principles? Well, I'm going to say, the time when I do apply these principles, I often look at design as a two-prong or a two-phase design. I use strategic design and tactical design. A strategic design is a very high-level design. A tactical design is a, often a low-level design. A strategic design gives me a direction and idea to go to. A tactical design paves the way to refine those ideas into realities of the project. I tend to use these principles a little bit during strategic design. I do use these a lot during tactical design. In other words, I use these principles almost every time I sit and write software. When I design and write code, I use these principles. So these principles are things I use almost on every single day, every hour that I work with software. I use these principles. I find these principles to be extremely valuable for that reason. And I also tend to use these. How do I use this? There are two ways I use this. I use these principles as a way to discuss among developers. So I I would sit down with developers and I would say, hey, if we do this, we'll be violating the open close principle. Hey, let's apply the dependency inversion principle here. Let's apply YAGNI and postpone this. So we use this as a vocabulary to communicate. We also often tend to use this as a way to communicate, a way to really use this during TDD or test-driven development. Because to me, Writing a test case really is not about writing a test case. If I use TDD as a vehicle of writing test cases, I'm not going to be very effective at it. And instead, what I do is, when I start writing test cases, I often ask, what does this test do? How does it feel to use this ob uh, object? What are the consequences? Am I increasing coupling when I use this particular object? The test kind of makes you think about it. What is the cohesion? What is the responsibility of this class I'm designing? Hey, if I use this particular code, am I going to violate open close principle here? Or should I really use dependency inversion principle to gain access and test this code? So I tend to use these principles a lot when I'm writing test cases, even before I implement the code to make these test cases to pass, I apply them very constantly and continuously. So they have been very, very powerful and useful for, for that reason. Um, yeah, I will update my website to post this list of topics. I won't post any code in this case because the codes were not that really significant, but I will post these uh, topic list on my website, agiledeveloper.com. And uh, so applying these principles has been, has been very rewarding for me. Uh, I would say that a lot of code, uh, it's, it's a learning process. I don't think I can claim that I have a perfect design. I don't think I will ever have a perfect design. But I think I'm getting better every day as I'm doing design. And my design is a lot better today than it was, say, about five years ago. I would say thanks to a lot of these principles. I've uh, learned over time and applied them. But applying these principles has been the real reward for me. And I hope you will find them useful as well. Thanks for your time.